grab hold of your flies. This is a podcast for nymphers, strippers, swingers, and dry fly guys. It's the show that brings you stories, instruction, and conservation from three guys who live it every day. This is The Open Fly. It's trade show season. Yeah. It's over for me. Yeah, you had your two? Uh... I think I did do two this year. Yeah, I think I'm going to like five or six. Just got done with one. Thankfully, it was close to home. Flying out tomorrow for another. I'll get home on Monday. Be home for like two days. I'll fly out for another. Where'd Be you home tra- for like two or three days and fly out for another one after that. And what do you, what do you, even after that. What do you trade at these shows? Uh, fishing goods. Wampum. Mm-hmm. Good, good trade. Good yeah, I've been, been doing the entire pretty much... Uh, circuit of the fly fishing show circuit and that's about over i think i got two more of those and then moving on to other random shows and it takes a lot out of you your um, booth was busy the entire weekend i mean when i had a chance to step away from the one that i was at yeah we were pretty slammed you were busy and i cast a sweet little alan like i forget the name of it but that heritage rod I think heritage rod yeah. that was that was nice yeah i appreciated that cool i'm glad we were busy over there at the stream tech booth as well mm-hmm. and we were right next to a bookseller that had a ton of olive books for sale the angling bookstore the they're angling all, yeah they're they're a big supporter yeah. always have been um they yeah. didn't invite me back this year to the author booth no who would um those were those were well attended that was right across from where the booth was and where our booth was and there was jeff courier was there i got a picture of him of the, you know uh, actually drawing another yeah. box we're, we're raffling off some jeff courier stuff right, later right, right. on today yeah. but nobody was signing up for you know the, the guy that wrote the uh al Ritt, the 25 best places to fly fish yeah nobody got an autograph so it's yeah it's not that cool to meet an author it's kind of like me seeing your first disc jockey it's one of the first major disappointments in life yeah we're doing autographs next uh show circuit next year <laughs> yeah <laughs> stay tuned <laughs> Can you imagine that? Just us sitting at a table with our Sharpies, kind of waiting, nobody coming by. Like right now. <laughs> right now. <laughs> you're all much uglier than I thought. Yeah, you're exactly right. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, it's a, it's a busy time of year. It's, it's, it's bittersweet. It's, it's great to meet people and, yeah. and get out and network. And it's actually a lot of fun, but, man, am I tired. Yeah. Always tired. But, yeah, it's not, this is not a complaint segment. It's a... Uh, I'm trying to find an. I'm giving you all my excuse for why I'm low on energy today. It's just today. That's all it is. And it's yeah. hump day. It's it eight is mile. It's eight miles an hour below speed limit day today. It is. Yeah. It is. So Keep that is trucking. today. Keep on trucking. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Kirk, mm-hmm. you look like you want to say something. Um, we have uh, some stickers and things in studio here yeah, today. Yeah, some koozies from uh, Fiberglass Manifesto. Yeah, they yeah. sent us things. Yeah. Thanks, reason. Cameron. Yeah. Cameron Mortensen. He's a. Uh, He's a big voice in the social media world of fly fishing. So are we going to send those to some lucky listener at some point? No, we're keeping this stuff. Oh. <laughs> yeah, no, those don't go anywhere. Screw the listeners. Mm-hmm. This is cool stuff. Yeah, nice. We could probably use those koozies on our coffee mugs. and. No, it's going on my PBR. Oh, okay, yeah. Mine's we, camo as well. If you so listen to the last couple of shows, you can, hear us, you can hear us slamming down our coffee mugs and beer glasses and everything throughout the entire show. So I had a little padding wouldn't hurt. Summer's but, coming. Cold PBR oh, for the coming. summer podcast. I thought you were a Coors man. Uh, PBR. No. I'm, I'm I'm seeing the light. Yeah. Are you? Good. Yeah. <laughs> Same stuff, tables, different can. Tables have turned. <laughs> tables have turned. <laughs> you can drink 14 or 15 in a day and not even have to worry about it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I'm yeah. all about the lateral move when it comes to beer. <laughs> yeah, forget about forget about the stuff that I brew in my garage, ten feet from where you're sitting, well, and that's, fresh that's, on tap. That's eighteen percent liquor, dude. That's it's not quite. That's it's stout. Like eight and a half. Yeah, that makes me well, stupid. I've got a. It I've got a. Stupid. I've got a more reasonable pilsner that's going to be on within the next show. Is or that two. the name of it? The reasonable pilsner. It is now. <laughs> yeah, right. Trademark. So just, trademark. Trademark. I want some money off that. Yeah, so, reasonablepilsner.com. We've been rabbling or just babbling on for five minutes and had, haven't even. That's all right. So haven't even. Know. Yeah, I don't know. The people want that. They say the people like that. They, Give the people what they right. want. We get we get multiple emails and comments. Man, I love that you guys aren't trying to teach us anything and just. <laughs> <laughs> well, like well, we we try. We tried to teach knots a couple of episodes ago, and that yeah. went over really well. <laughs> went over like a fart in an elevator. People yeah. love that. <laughs> <laughs> mm-hmm. 
Yeah, so um, welcome to episode, what are we on, six? I'm losing count. Eight. Six. Six. Wow. Yeah. Is that a milestone? It's a multiple of two or three. It's more than halfway there if we're going to ten. Yeah. Yeah. That's all. This podcast goes to eleven. Yeah, yeah, we just uh, one month. Uh, we hit our one month anniversary, I think, last week ish, and uh, reached our five thousandth listener, which is yay. way more than I thought. So, yay us! Yay, yay you! Yay five thousandth listener! Yay you! Thank you, everybody, for downloading twenty to thirty to forty episodes apiece. Just downloading it, deleting it, downloading it, yeah. deleting it. We appreciate yeah. you padding our numbers. The Olympics right. of downloads, because there can't possibly be five thousand of you out there. <laughs> All right, Kirk, how about we go on to uh, listener feedback and questions and everything else that uh, the people want to have read over the air? Okay, well, the first uh, comment actually comes from our Twitter feed, and it is by at... Now, I don't know if this is my mine excursion or my min excursion, whatever. It's... You we, know who you is are, it a Adam. Excursion? Yes. Adam. Adam tweets... Stick to your format, avoid the how-to, enjoying the conservation conversations, and guide storytelling, dot, dot, dot. Well, dot, dot, dot to you too, Adam. <laughs> Thanks for writing. Trace dots. Yeah, we already, uh, we already talked about that uh, a couple minutes ago. Clearly he wasn't listening. Right. Yeah. Uh, yeah, th- we're not here to teach you. Maybe the guides that we bring on will have some wisdom to... Bring up here and there, but you know, there's other instructional podcasts out there, like we said before, and they do a good job of it. So, we're here to do something completely different. And teaching people how to fly fish is Derek's job, and he does not want to be working when he's in here. So, and Kirk and I, you just, you know, I'm a dirty gear fisherman, and Kirk is Kirk. So, I'm a fish preservationist, and I leave no impact on the resource. He's a minimal impact angler. That's right. Anyway, thanks for the tweet. Tweet. Can we get an RT? What? What is an RT? Hashtag. Oh, thanks. Uh, you're much more Twitter savvy than I, have I am. I have no idea what you're talking about. That's all right. Mm. Uh, moving on, uh, Dan Nelson writes, and I'm going to have to paraphrase because Dan writes a lot. Oh, Dan's a friend of the show. He is. But he's not paying for airtime, so. No. Oh, he, he does donate, so he, he's one of our monthly donors. Oh, okay. Then I'll read every word loving. Yeah, like I said, he is a friend of the show. Indeed. Friend of the show. Dan Nelson writes, hey, guys. Hi. Hi. Loving the shows. So are we. Though I made smart-ass comments previously, I honestly did enjoy listening to shows one through four during my forced captivity in North Carolina during last week's ice storm. What's wrong with number five? I think it was probably before that. Mm. We'll give him the benefit of the doubt. Plus he was in North Carolina. Yeah. I'm betting you have a full slate of content planned for a few months, but I had a couple suggestions for future consideration. I'm sure your listeners would love to hear about the secondary aspects of the fly fishing industry. I'm thinking things like interviewing the host fly fishing TV shows and even tangential fly fishing businesses. Let me know if you'd like contact information for any of these folks. Greg and the Dry Fly guys in Spokane, while Hillary and Shane are in Columbia Falls, Whitefish area. That's the Trout TV, folks. Mm -hmm. I'll spend time in the Seattle area, though. Um, No ending punctuation. He's a graduate of the Edward R. Murrow School of Communication, I believe. Yeah, as am I. As am I. Who who is what? what? Dan. 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 Go Cougs. Go Cougs. Um, But we we won't edit edit what he submitted here um yeah i think it'd be great to talk to some yeah. you know yeah we'd, we we discussed amongst ourselves a while ago doing the same thing and i uh it was it yesterday the day before when i read dan's email i was thinking you know what, maybe it's time i put this on the book so i scheduled a show that's tentatively one i'm going to try and fill up with those type of guests have a few ideas uh yeah just industry or people in the industry that are not guides kind of loosely affiliated with fly fishing you know you got dry uh, like dry fly whiskeys or dry fly distillery out in spokane you know it's very fly fishing uh influence and very big in the fly fishing culture uh, we got a new brewery showing up here uh in the seattle area that's like Flycaster brewing and i've met the brewer from that a couple times and you know uh, you guys have other ideas for well not- yeah at the show this <clears throat> last last week when i talked with um the guys from 
a uh, periodical that's associated closely with the industry and talked about mm -hmm. the role of advertising and marketing in the industry and how that can play a part in the whole thing. So, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, the, the fly fishing. And, and so so this is, this show is more than just fly fishing centric. It, it's, I mean, j not just the act of fly fishing, but it's fly fishing culture and the people involved in it. And sometimes that uh, extends beyond the river. So, yeah, we're fully open to that. Kirk, yeah. what's your thoughts? I Yeah, I think we might want to feature some children's book author or something. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Who like who? I don't know. I I don't even know if there are any books for children about fly fishing. No, somebody should go Google that. Yeah, right. check it out. Moving on. Okay, moving on. Uh, it's our groupie Jen. Uh, Jen Korea. writes in. Jen writes. <laughs> Kirk once gave me some very good advice on my blog. He talked about lucky fishing hats and how his had treated him or not over the years. I want to know how the new Open Fly podcast hat will treat me if I decide, decide to give it a go. Does it come with any special fishiness that Derek can rub off on it? What are you rubbing off on the hat? <laughs> Mostly dandruff these days. <laughs> oh, that's fishy. I have been using a new conditioner. <laughs> I don't want Kirk to touch mine, though. Whoa! <laughs> Ouch. Ooh. Evan, don't, don't blame her. Evan, I'm still not sure about. You don't want that. Ooh. I catch fish, but I cheat. <laughs> I think we got people like on the on this show pretty much convinced at this point that I don't even fly fish. Well, it's you know <laughs> I'm looking at an impressive stack of rods and reels over here, so you must at least do some. Yeah, there's I think there's like 20 fly rods over there and like three or four not fly rods. So. Hmm. It's all right. It, it's really all the same thing. I like fishing. I do, too. Um, thanks, Jen, for writing in yet again. Did we answer all your questions? I don't think we answered anything. But yeah, that's okay. Let's move on. It sounds on. like she wants a hat. She does. Um, all right. She's in the running now. She, she that makes her in the running. Or if she doesn't want to wait to, to win one, she can go to our website and uh, buy, one. buy one. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about our model. We've had a lot of uh, comments about our, our, our hat model. Oh, the Creepy Rubber Boy? Yeah. Uh, the Creepy Rubber Boy is actually a, uh, a rubber torso with a head attached uh, used in boxing gyms and martial arts studios for target practice. When you can't hit a real kid, but you, wanna, you want to, you hit, you hit the yeah. it's it's Creepy that, Rubber it's Boy. So is this know, like in your living room or...? No, this isn't it in my living room. It's oh. those yellow eyes and that obviously angry brow that says, hit me, and it's a kid. Yeah. It's a little disturbing. Well, it's... We're better, a disturbing bunch. It's better than hitting a real kid. Not here, hit. not now, not ever. <laughs> <laughs> hit the rubber boy. Maybe we should bring him in studio. Oh, we yeah. Could. That would, he would be good here. He could he be would, our fourth man. He could. Kind of like the twelfth man for the Seahawks. Hmm. Uh, which is a fairly good segue to the uh, the next comment from Mark with a C. Keep up the good work. I enjoy the conversations and perspectives you continue to provide. Being a Niners fan, quack, mm. I almost stopped listening after the basking in the glory of the Seahawks. You win. should have stopped listening. Because right. we beat you. Yeah. <clears throat> Then I remembered I listened to your show for your fly fishing content rather than football analysis. We are starting a football show soon. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Because I'm I'm an expert on that topic. Sports I don't know if you guys balls. knew. Yeah, the the local is he mad about our local sports ball team? Something and what happened or something? Yes. Yeah. Well, there's no time like the off season to start a football podcast. So. <laughs> Uh, let's see. Anyway, Mark continues, I have questions about leaders, not the typical difference between fluoro and mono. I prefer to use mono for surface presentation and fluoro for nymphing and streamers. Smart man. Yeah. My question is, how do, can I determine the difference when they are loose in my pack and unlabeled? Do you guys have a streamside easy technique to determine what material a leader is made of? Now that now that winter's here, I'm cleaning my pack out, and I can't tell w which is which. Help. Well, keep them organized in the first place, and then yeah. you wouldn't have to waste our time. Next question. Here's a simple one, though, however. It's fairly easy. The, the floral will be a little technique. bit heavier, and so just put both in a cup of water yep. 
and see which one sinks faster yeah. than the other one. Exactly. That's what I was going to say. Fluorocarbon sinks much faster than mono. Uh, mono is kind of neutrally buoyant, and fluorocarbon actually sinks. So, yeah. And for the very same reasons he's using fluoro for nymphing and monos yeah. for dry flies, he's answered his own question, so move along. Sure. Typical really? 49ers fan yeah. Niners behavior. Yeah. How do I clap to win a game later? <laughs> we we what's his name? Mark with a C. Mark with a C. We appreciate your question. Don't. We do, and, and as I, a listener, yeah, I mean, yeah, we do. We do. It's a tough kind of love here. Sorry. You yeah. the, the, the the Niners make the Seahawks a better team, and we appreciate you for that. Yeah. So thanks for helping us make a better podcast. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. See, we're all in this together. All right. right. Okay. Little little healthy competition. I actually needed that to get over the hump of the fact that it's a hump day. Hump day. What day is it? Hump day. Tuesday. Yeah. What? Oh, it's Wednesday. It is. Damn yeah, it. it's Wednesday. I always right. get that wrong. Do we have a uh, one from Jen in there somewhere? Yeah, Jen writes. <laughs> Jen writes. Uh, next up, Taylor writes, and not sure if this is a Taylor or a Taylor. Gender ambiguous. Yeah, a suit maker or a. I don't know. All right. Oh, um, my oh. Da- my daughter is a Taylor, not right. a Taylor. She's going to be a teacher actually, but her name is Taylor. <laughs> And you you live in a neighborhood with that similar name. Yeah, exactly. So um, anyway, Taylor writes, just wanted to say I stumbled upon your podcast the other day and absolutely love it. We should stop right there. Yeah, (laughs) thanks. It was on the ground and then she fell over it. That's kind of, assuming that's a she. Uh, Oh, crap. There's open open flies laying all over the place. They. We'll assume that they, yeah. I've listened to all the episodes in the last week or so while commuting to work, and I have learned a lot about fly fishing as well as had a lot of good laughs. I think they, I think Taylor might be confusing us for another podcast. Yeah, there's nothing to learn here. No. We don't teach things. Uh, we did learn how to tie a blood knot on the last show. Yeah. yeah. I'm Moving just, on. Oh, we also taught people how to tell the difference between leaders as That's well. That's true. So, so you've learned two things now. Wow. Yeah. Um. Taylor lives in New England and was wondering if you're going to have any guests from this side of the country. Thanks, guys. Yes. Yes. New England? New England, not old England. Uh, We we could do both. We do have some stuff coming up from people on the the far east side of our great nation. We travel the continent in search of people to bring Mm -hmm. to our listening audience. We're huge in the upper northeast. Huge. (laughs) And we have the web data to prove it. Is the the Northeast kind of like the new Japan? We're huge in Japan, but that's that's like 10 years ago. Now we're we're huge in the Northeast. Is that the new cool thing? What? I don't know. Uh, you know, the people say we're huge in Japan, and that was like the cool thing back in the day. Oh, yeah. No, we're huge in the Northeast. You're thinking of turning Japanese. Do, 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 do. I really think so. I think we're big in Canada, too, aren't hey. we? That is our second biggest country. Yeah. I don't Where is this going? I don't know. <laughs> but thanks for the question. Yeah, yeah, so that wraps up our listener feedback. Uh, remember, write to us. Yeah, so uh, I believe we're going to choose one of them to receive a free hat at the end of the show. Are we just going to choose them now, or do you want to do it after the show? We'll just yeah. send it to What's them. What's the criteria? I don't know. We just said anybody that sends us feedback is, is in the running for a free hat on mm. the show. Well, that's easy, easy pickings. Easy pickings. It is. Yeah. Do you want to announce a listener, or are we just? No, that's that's not that's. Oh, not, this is no, that's they, for that's for the next drawing. So, who do we want to give it to? Uh, pick the best. Pick the best one. Okay, I'm out of these comments here. Yeah. Hold hold the paper up like that, Derek. To my forehead. I'm, no, this way, and I'm going to blindly drop my finger on the name Would of the you person. Point the microphone in that direction so our listeners can see. Yeah. Okay. Hold it flat, Derek, because I'm going to drop my finger just like dropping a pin. Uh, is that Jen? It, it went to Jen, actually. <laughs> yeah. All right. Hey, Jen. Jen, you were uh, you were randomly chosen to receive our free hat. Excellent. I will rub on it. Yep. <laughs> yeah. So that it's lucky. Okay. I can't make any promises, but she was unsure about me anyway, so it may or may not have Evan rubbed on it when you when you get it. Are we going to do That sounds th- terrible. It does sound bad. <laughs> um are we going to do this again? Do we have any other hats to give away? Uh eventually. Okay. Keep calling in, keep writing in. We got to I mean nobody wants to talk to us, so we got to kind of bribe them to to send us content. 
Yeah, I don't understand the hesitation. We're an approachable bunch. Well, we 49ers are. fans get out here and they ask these silly Yeah, if a 49ers fan can do it, anybody. Oh, Jen is a Broncos fan. Oh, hey, oh, a Broncos fan. Let's send Mark a Seahawk hat. Do we have a Seahawk hat? <laughs> Uh, no, I'm uh, fresh out. Okay. I don't even, I don't own a single piece of Seahawks anything. You're not a true sports baller. Yeah. I am not. A, I'm a bandwagon fan. I don't even say fan. I'm a bandwagon follower to the max. You're like the 13th guy. I Yeah, 13th or 14th. I'm, I'm far down the list. <laughs> yeah. Let's so. do some follow-up. Follow-up on previous topics that we've discussed on previous shows. Uh, yeah, a lot of things happening with the uh, issues and or- organizations that we've talked to previously. Derek, what's the, the top of the list here? <clears throat> top of the list is going to be Utah Stream Access Coalition. Sounds like there's 21 days left in the Utah session where HB 37 is still stuck in the House Rules Committee. Uh, make sure that you're emailing and are calling members of the House right now. Let them know that you support House Bill 37, Utah Stream Access Coalition. You can find them on the web and also on Facebook. Facebook. Right on. Facebook. Help them fight the fight, too. Send them some change. Yeah, and then send us the verification that you helped, and we'll put you on the drawing. Actually, we need to do that. We'll do that drawing after this segment, but okay. the drawing for the the uh, Jeff, Jeff Courier fly box. Yes. So, yeah, moving on. Uh, next up, uh, what was the – we had some other things. Uh, beads in Wyoming, we talked about that a little bit. And I think we're going to expand a little bit on that. We talked last show about uh, them banning bead fishing in Wyoming because it was becoming pretty rampant apparently and uh, did not suit their definition of what fly fishing is. So uh, Derek or Kirk, did you guys have any other any other things to add to that? We talked a little bit about it at the beginning of the show, but it's being kind of seen like as a precedent and some other things going on in, in Michigan that are slightly related. Slightly related, there in Michigan, there's a uh, movement to reinstate a ban on chumming in rivers. So effectively, people are killing wild fish for their eggs and then using them as chum in the rivers, and then either you know fishing right below or, or above that. And do they have chum salmon in the Great Lakes? I don't Ooh. They're chum salmon, but no, they don't. So oh, chumming! Chumming! chumming. Yeah. Oh, not so. chumming as in fishing for chum. So there's yeah, there, that's an issue too. Yeah, uh, I did want to add too, and I, I didn't get on to this, and this might open up some further debate. And we're all about controversy here because that boosts ratings, right? Uh, sure it does. You know the 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 problem I see with something like uh, the bead ban in Wyoming, uh, and it, which is going to encourage people to use regular egg flies, which are within regulations where egg flies are uh, tied on the hook, or you have a bead that's attached to the hook. Uh, the reason why pegged beads, which does not fit the definition of fly fishing uh, in most places, but pegged beads where the, the bead is pegged onto the line about an inch or two above the hook, depending on the size of the bead or the size of the fish. The reason why that technique was developed was for the safety of the fish. Uh, when they take that bead in with the, that's pegged on the line, the, the hook will hook them in the mouth. The way they intake eggs uh, naturally is they kind of engulf them and... With regular egg flies, you see a lot of throat hooked and deep hooked fish, and that's how that's why the pegged thing was was developed, or, or that's why that technique was started in the first place. And personally, I've seen a lot of fish caught on beads because, as we've determined, I'm kind of a dirty fisherman and fished a lot of dirt bags. Uh, I've seen a lot of bead caught fish. Every single one of them never caught anywhere but in the corner of the mouth and on the inside. Even a lot of people say it's you're going to snag them on the outside. I've yet to ever see that. So. That's my take on that. Um, I don't really. I, I, if they want to ban egg flies and beads, I I would say sure. But the fact that the regular egg flies are still legal when those I see is a bigger problem. I I don't know if I agree fully with keeping those on there. Well, I think the uh, the lawmakers from Wyoming certainly didn't consult with you, Evan Burke. Nope. They should call me next time. They should. No, you'll get that same story from a lot of uh, a lot of experienced guides like. Uh, Joe Willauer, who we're going to have on the show in a couple of weeks, uh, he's a he's a big believer in that well, and has also seen a lot of fish caught on beads. And uh, I had discussed discussed it with him, and he he says, "Yeah, I've never seen a bead caught fish where it was pegged, hooked anywhere but in the corner of the mouth." Uh, and uh, Mark Hieronymus from uh, Trout Unlimited in Southeast Alaska, where Alaska egg flies and beads are very popular. He is a strong opponent of egg flies where the egg is tied on the hook because he has seen time and time again, egg flies killing fish yeah. when the, he is a big, he, in fact, his uh, presentation he put on at the fly fishing show this last week, and I didn't see it, but he was telling me he's 
taken a point now in the Trout Unlimited presentation to tell people, if you're going to fish egg flies, peg a bead because that saves fish. Hmm. And I'm hoping we get hate mail because of this. And I'm not going to claim it's fly fishing. I, I, if somebody wants to call it gear fishing, that's fine. I, that doesn't offend me. <laughs> well, if you if you go to the craft store and you buy a, a plastic bead and then stick a little hackle on it, then it's fly fishing. Sure. If it's attached to the hook. Sure. Mm-hmm. I think the biggest challenge is that, I mean, amongst all of them, the biggest challenge is that, one, if you have a technique that is, when done effectively, it's safer for the fish, but there's all, there's people that are stretching that boundary. So right. you see the, the bead that's pegged four inches above the hook, and a lot of that is done with some of the research I've done and people I've heard from in Wyoming that it's, you know, pegging a bead that far above the hook is actually better for the angler because they have slow response times to the take. Mm-hmm. So the longer that bead has to travel down towards the hook, the better because the guy that's fishing can be slower on the, the hook set. So that mm-hmm. seems like, like a little bit of, of a crutch. Right. The other one for me too is that you know, one of the big arguments is that you're using a bead during a time when there are spawning fish. So it, it's naturally matching the hatch. No problem with that. It's when you're, pegging a bead and fishing outside of the spawning oh, sure. spawning time. I see bead rigs and trees in the middle of summer. Right. I mean, that's the, the only time high. I'll use them. Yeah. I mean, I'll use them during times when I'm fishing. Well, usually when I'm just fishing behind spawning fish. Mm-hmm. Uh, a lot of times, I, a lot of the trout and uh, steelhead fishing I do in the fall, mm-hmm. I look for pods of Chinook and fish near them, and those fish will not eat anything else. Yeah. And so I'll fish it then. Um, I, I won't fish it this time of year. I mean, there's nothing, there's no reason to. <laughs> One that argument I think is that, you know, if you fish a if you fish a bead when there's eggs present in the water because fish are spawning, and then you stop doing that, that'd be the same as telling somebody they can't fish a, a dry fly in the middle of winter time when they that use that same dry fly in the in the summertime. So right. if the fish is going to come up and eat it, the fish is going to come up and eat it. I think there's a lot of negative negativity that goes along this this technique because when it works, and it works and really two, well. Defi- <laughs> it doesn't fit into the definition of fly fishing. No, so and you I, get somebody doing it in a fly fishing only area, mm-hmm. it causes problems. It does. You know, I, and as somebody that uses that technique to match the hatch at certain times of year, I'm, I make no claims that it's fly fishing just because I don't really have a set definition for what fly fishing is other than a line delivery method. But I don't, you know, I don't, I don't care, I guess. <laughs> so if they want to ban it in fly fishing only waters, I, I'm not opposed to that, but I think they should look into also banning regular egg flies because I think those are those. I mean, I've, I've seen deep hooked fish on those too, and I haven't used them for a long time because of that. Anybody uh, from Wyoming that has a, a strong opinion one way or another on this? We're going to have, um, nobody lives in Wyoming. <laughs> I've got somebody that I want to bring on the show to talk about it. A guy who uses beads on the North Platte. And oh, yeah. he's a strong proponent of them. So is that where you fished with Cinda? That when is the, where I fished when with the Cinda. wind blew. So he's a proponent of using beads yeah. for just effectiveness or fish safety or yes. Yes. All right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm sure we've offended just about every type of angler in this segment, but you know, controversy boost rating. So That's what we do. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, bead fishing. Very controversial. A lot of it's it's a pretty pretty uh complex topic. What are you pointing at, Kirk? Uh, the Wild Reverence book right. poster on the wall. Segway, speaking of Steelhead, uh, yeah, Wild Reverence Shane Anderson, who uh, joined us on our first show. He took a leap of faith and put his reputation on the line to talk to three really unknown people about his film and went rather well. It helped us kick our, kick our show off with a bang. And uh, he has completed his project. The, the movie is done, and he's filing legal paperwork and everything and getting it to... Uh, a bunch of film festivals and all that. So look out for that. Uh, Kirk, did you have anything else to add? No. Um, yeah, I'm eager to see that, that film. I hope that it answers a lot of questions because just recently there's been even more discussion about the state of the wild Olympic peninsula steelhead. Mm -hmm. And, uh, this is going to be a necessary vehicle to speak for the fish. Yeah, I agree. Uh, yeah, th- this this winter more than most, I think there's been a lot more uh, articles, videos, things like that on this topic. Uh, there was what I would call a borderline, or not borderline, just straight up propaganda piece uh, in support of hatcheries that came out about a month ago that I I was pretty appalled at. You know, they almost made me believe what they were saying because it was so convincing. So you know, there's there's stuff coming from both sides, and I wanted to also mention a. Uh, Guide uh, Olympic Peninsula guide named Bob Triggs recently wrote a really really excellent article on why he's not uh, guiding for steelhead on the Olympic Peninsula this year, 
Um, it's it's kind of hard to find the article. He has a blog spot. Uh, what was it? Fly fishing. Olymp- Washington. Olympic Peninsula fly fishing dot blogspot dot com. Yeah. Well, for an old short guy, your memory is freaking good. Yeah. yeah. Uh, he wrote an article that was uh, posted yesterday. <laughs> Quack. Uh, I think it's February 17th. So look for the one posted February 17th. Excellent, excellent article uh, from Bob Triggs on the state of the fishery out there and how he personally uh, just no longer feels like he should be guiding out there. So go, Bob. Yeah, that's, you know, I'm in the same boat. I usually I put on every year a big camping trip out there with a group of friends where it gets 10, 20 plus of us out there uh, camping out, having a good time and then hitting the river in the day. And this year leading up to it, I just had a gut feeling that I just I couldn't sanction that this year and support it. So told all my fishing buddies that I were just, you know, if you want to fish out there, I'm not going to tell you no, but I can't personally uh, organize a group, essentially gangbang of the river when <laughs> there's hardly any fish. Uh, there's multiple boats going down the river. Um, you know, it's just not something I want to be a part of. Um, and I'm not trying to take away from any of the guys that are making a living out there this this winter. Uh, there's plenty of them that I'm friends with and, and support, but, uh, you know, personally, I just, I can't jump into that this year. So anything else from you guys? I think about that, that issue. And if more guys like Bob decide that they're going to not facilitate, you know, what they see is it from a personal thing, that pressure is just going to move from place to place. Oh, I, I mean, you close the coast, you know, the coastal drain, the sound drainages, you close the coast, then there, right now, there are more guides than there are clients and fish. Oh yeah, this yeah. will this will there will be a fallout here. There'll be a weeding out. And yeah, and I'm, you know, I'm just not really. I mean, I'm, I, it's not that I'm diverting my pressure. I'm personally just not really fishing this time of year much anymore. So, just you know, I got other hobbies, and I'm going to wait till summer comes, and then I got other fisheries. There's some kind of off the radar fisheries that I hit, especially out in the salt water and stuff like that, that have plenty of fish that I'm going to partake in and. I'm just going to save my energies and take part in other hobbies this time of year because uh, the coastal steelhead in Washington that I have access to just can't really can't really handle my pressure anymore because you know I'm very effective as a maybe fisherman. if uh, Occupy Skagit gets their way they'll yeah. open that river back up and that'll take some of the pressure off the OP. God, I hope so. I mean, the Skagit's a healthier river than the Ho by leaps and bounds, but we can't fish it. What's the date for Occupy Skagit this year? Is it? It's like my birthday, I think. No, no, no. That was last year. I think it's um, March 29th. 29th. Yeah, 29th. I'm, I'm out uh, at the Wasatch Fly Fishing Expo in Utah that weekend, so if you're there, you can come say hi, but if you're in the Pacific Northwest, uh, look into Occupy Skagit to go out and show your support for opening the Skagit back up to a catch and release season to kind of relieve some of the pressure off the depressed Olympic Peninsula rivers. Yeah, they do have a Facebook page. Occupy Skagit looks like scheduled. Occupy Skagit two is Saturday, March 29th. Howard Miller Steelhead Park. So yeah. Rockport. Yeah. Rockport. If you're in the area, go participate. Yeah. Great. Uh, anything else? I think that was pretty much. Oh, we wanted to cover a very Pacific Northwest centric in that last little segment, but you know what? That's where we live, so you're going to hear about that a lot. Yeah. If you have an issue in your corner of the country or Canada or world, let us know and we will talk about it. We but can't you, guarantee we're going to you know, help you, but we'll talk about it. <laughs> the only way to do that is to contact us. How can they contact us, Kirk? Smoke signal, carrier pigeon, or <laughs> Pony Express. Exactly. Smoke and a pond cake. Yep. Yeah, you Might can go to our... Yeah, go to our website, uh, theopenflypodcast.com. Our Facebook, which is becoming increasingly useless because Facebook has a new business model that doesn't really help us. Uh, Google+, Plus, Twitter. Facebook. Yeah, Facebook. Mm. They're they're bumming me out lately. We'll figure it out. Yeah, we'll figure it out. But you, you can manually go to our Facebook and look at our posts, but they won't let it show up in your feeds except for if they feel like it. So. If you like it and share it. Yeah, like and share our posts. That will help a lot. Yeah, everything share. we post. Go to our go to our, our our site or our Facebook page and like everything and yeah. comment on them. Become needy and overbearing. Yeah, <laughs> there there's no such thing as too much attention on our Facebook. We will treat you with respect and professionalism. Yeah, and you can subscribe by clicking on the iTunes link on our website or just going into your iTunes and searching for the open fly podcast. We will show up on there and you can hit the subscribe button and we will automatically be downloaded to your I thingy. But what if I don't do iTunes? I'm glad you asked. There's also stitcher radio. So you can get that on your, yeah, you can get that on your Android device or on your I thingy or 
on your desktop PC. Hmm. You know, if you're like, got an eye thingy last couple of weeks. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Bueno. Nice. I have a, I have a Winders phone. Winders. Winders. Because yeah. I'm a Winders person. Winders. Winders. I haven't even looked in to see what options there are for Winders phone, but they exist, I'm sure. Sure. You can just download it to your desktop and drop it onto your SkyDrive. That'll work. Do you have Publisher on your Windows phone? A what? Microsoft Publisher. I don't know what that is. Good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. So that wraps it up. Kirk, why don't you go ahead and draw our winner for the Jeff Courier Flybox? We have two Allen Guide fly cases uh, that have been hand-drawn on by the famous Jeff Courier, author and artist. Uh, there's a re- uh, no golden dorado and a tarpon, uh, one on each. Uh, so you'll the winner will get to choose which one they want uh, by emailing us and letting us know, and we will send you the one of your choice. And we will raffle off the next one on another month. So I need to get a hat. Hold on. Is this is the coffee mug it's not big enough? Tight. Okay, so he's got an open fly trucker hat that is going to be. Is this the one that Jen's going to get? Yes. Uh, yeah, it might be. Okay. Jen, your hat now has everybody's name in it. I have ports. You're getting a lot of a lot of things rubbing off on your hat. <laughs> Everybody is rubbing off on your hat. Yeah. Right yeah. There's. All right, and the winner is the winner is Mark Damon. Mark, Mark with a K. Mark with a K. Right. I'm not on. a 49ers fan. Right on. Wow. Wow. Not that I know. Congratulations. Of. Cool. All right, Mark. Uh, go ahead and email us, and we uh, I have your address and everything. I can just ship it out, but I would like you to choose which one of these boxes you'd like. Uh, Actually, we're right out in front of the house with the, in a van right now. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, thanks for the donations, Mark. Yeah, appreciate it. There's actually a lot more of you than I, we anticipated, and we really appreciate that. It's helping me get a little bit uh, less in the black yeah. for doing this because I'm very much in the black right now. I'd like to keep my wife in my house and stuff like that, so... You know, the, the sooner we get things uh, in the green, or is, is it, yeah, or the red, I don't know. The red red and black are bad, right? Uh, black is good. Black, oh, no, we're in the red. I yeah. want to be in the black. Yeah. You know, living in the back of your truck down by the river is not all that bad. It's not? No. I think my wife would disagree. Well, well she'll find another she'll guy. She'll find another guy. <laughs> <laughs> Plenty of them she'll around. She'll be a wife, just somebody else. Yeah. <laughs> she'll, get over, she'll get over you in a big hurry. Touche, right? yeah. Am I drawing a name, too? No. No, no, we're doing another one in another month. All right, we gotta, we gotta. Let's take all the people out of jail. So, uh, which box is Mark getting? Is he getting well, the? If you were listening, I just answered that question. Well, gets... I, I tune out most of what I said. He gets to choose which one he wants. Oh, so uh, Mark, if you haven't seen the picture yet, you can go to our Facebook where we have, and on our Google Plus, yeah, I might add. I'm holding them both up. Yep. <laughs> And you can choose, uh, you can find the picture on our Facebook and choose which one that you want. And we will raffle off the other one uh, in a coming month. So nice. thanks, Mark. And thanks, everybody else that did not win. You guys are the best losers that we've ever <laughs> been associated with. So. Very good at it, too. Yeah. Yeah. All right. I think that we've rambled on long enough about absolutely nothing for, was it? 37 minutes. We've got a lot of stuff to talk about on the show today, so let's get into it. Yeah, yeah let's. So we're going to get back with guide stories uh, with Derek shortly, who's going to introduce our really awesome guest, and uh, we'll be right back. Now back to the open fly. In three, two, and one. Derek, All right, let's get guide stories going. Start it over again. I was talking over you for a second. Shut up, dude. Evan. dude. Okay, three, two, and one. All right, let's get guide stories underway for this edition. Uh, this is, and I think I say it every time that we're doing guide stories, that this one's going to be the best one. Yeah. I, don't, I don't know if anybody agrees with that, but this is going to be a pretty might darn as, good one. Might so as well call it the best I'm one. I'm going to call this one the best one so far. So I think the stories we're going to get out of Rick Matney on this guide stories are going to be uh, pretty good. So, Rick, good morning. Good morning. What's going on? In, uh, are you in Bozeman right now? Yes, I am in Bozeman, Montana right now. Just came out of the woods. I was in Bozeman for a couple of weeks ago, and uh, now I'm here. So, And you're still there. I'm still there. All right. Barely. Just barely, huh? <laughs> yeah, I never know where Rick's at. He lives in Bozeman. Next thing you know, he like lives in the woods, yeah. or he's in some other state, and they're doing some other things. Uh, he's, he's all over the place. Witness protection? Witness yeah, protection. I was out on the coast last week. I caught a winter, my first winter on sea out of the year. So, oh, well, we're trying with guide stories. One of my ideas was to kind of start west and move our way east, and we've gotten as far east as 
Well, we went to Michigan. We went to Michigan. So that's as far east as we've been. So now we're making our way back west, but then we'll go further west all the way to Alaska. So we'll make sure that that comes in too. So uh, for those of you that do not know Rick, uh, Rick has an operation called Chrome Chasers. And um, if you look at his website, one of the things that sticks out to me about what he's doing up there is um, the sense of place and ethics. It's a big influence as a guiding operation. So Rick, where did you develop that sense of responsibility to the places that you guide and the species that define what you do? Well, you know, I probably started uh, growing up. We had uh, three private lakes in northeastern Washington with my dad that uh, were ones that we fished out of, and in a sense turned that into a business. And by having three lakes that you control, everything that goes on to it, it makes it real easy to see what kind of impact you have on a fishery, for instance, especially when you have total control over it. So I think that's probably where it started the most is where, you know, growing up with that kind of influence of everything I do affects this fishery. So it kind of ingrained in me and I could control how I wanted it to, to go for my, uh, in my favor or not my favor. So that's where it started. You know, then later on in life, as I grew up, I also, you know, went to school for uh, biology. I got a biology degree from Montana State University with an uh, emphasis on ethology, which is fisheries. So it's kind of been in my blood from my entire life, you know. Couple that with being a lifelong steelheader and being able to fish in a lot of places now that have changed so much from when I started fishing in them, you know, it gives you a real good sense of, of responsibility that everyone should have. Nice. And, and family is a big part of, of what you do. Did you Yeah, I mean, correct. Yeah. And that, that sense of ethics just kind of is ingrained in, in how you run your operation then and, and what you're trying to, you know, teach your clients? Yeah, absolutely. You know, when you can go to a place and see someplace where you know, basically man has not touched it and look how fertile and productive it is and know that that can be also attainable in the lower 48. You know, it's a good reminder of what, what can be. Mm-hmm. So it's refreshing to, to see a success story kind of deal. You know, every it's all doom and gloom for the most part, but every now and again there, there are these success stories that come through. And I think that's real important to uh, to acknowledge those and, and find out why they are a success and really take it apart. And it, it comes down to personal responsibility when it's all when it's all said and done. Yeah. Um, we were at the, uh, I think they call it Bobcat days over in, in Bozeman for school. And I was there with my daughter and for the first 10 or 12 minutes, they showed this video that talked all about all the great things that are there that you can do the whitewater rafting and the skiing and the fishing and the mountain biking and all that. How did you go from going to school there and getting that, the degrees that you got uh, into being a, a fly fishing guide and what, um, what does it take to run a big operation like you're doing in so many different places? <laughs> you have to be very flexible. Um, you know, it started out going to college. I had to work my way through summer somehow uh, and be able to pay for college, so it made perfect sense. Uh, you know, I kind of grew up in the outfitting industry uh, before college, and so it was an easy transition for me to make one move into Bozeman. And guide season in Bozeman is basically the summer. Well, I'm not going to school in the summer, and I was able to make enough money doing that to pay for my school for the rest of the time. So I basically worked my way through college <laughs> guiding for trout. So, um, And then... What turned into a small passion became an addiction, became a lifestyle. So after that, it kind of snowballed, and I started looking at other options and expanding. You know, I've been lucky enough to go down and guide bonefish in Hawaii, uh, Washington trout, steelhead, up to Alaska, Montana. And you really have to make a lot of personal sacrifices for that. And most people aren't going to stick around you when you're gone for four or five months from your home. I mean, you're looking at 30-hour days is what it seems like a lot of the time. It's like, <laughs> Wait. Actually, Unless yeah, 30 hours. 30, 30 hours. Yeah, that's not the normal scale. Yeah, yeah, I can pack 30 into 20. Yeah, I'm, I'm, or not. I'm checking my math, which is always my weak, so, my weak sometimes point. Sometimes days, Kirk, go past the clock. Yeah, yeah math checks out <laughs> on my end. You've got you to keep going. So, but, uh, but, but, but the point is, 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 you know, you have to have so many eggs in, in baskets all over the year. I mean, I have permits i got to fill out while I'm doing guide season in Montana, and you just really have to be on it and you have to basically not have any connections to family or home because you're just not going to be around that much. So yeah, and- if you're willing to make those sacrifices, it, it, you know, it's completely easy to go from one location to the next and switch seasons and everything else. And it's, uh, I've always had the travel bug in my lifetime anyways, and I love going different places and seeing new stuff. And so instead of paying to do it, I just basically set up businesses in the spots I like to go to. <laughs> Yeah, and and you brought up the uh, thing with permits, uh, bringing it back to Chrome Chasers. The the streams that you're on there, you're the only one guiding these streams. Is that correct? Is that yeah, how that works? That is cor- yeah, the way that Southeast Alaska is set up is that there's an extravagant permit process, which is great. 
and it's going to protect that fishery. It's one thing that I think should be implemented in the lower 48, even though a lot of guides would not agree with that. Um, but it really limits the amount of pressure that's put on the wild wild resource for sure. And so the rivers and streams that we fish, um, I'm the only one allowed to guide an outfit on it. Uh, the public can go up and fish those, but uh, I think as Evan knows, uh, that's almost physically impossible to get to without a pretty substantial adventurous bone and a lot of maps and to find all those places. And, it took and me about a, several boats. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, several boats. It takes at least two boat. to get to any of them. Yeah, that's right. I guess a two-boat minimum is what you're going to require. <laughs> and it's, uh, it's pretty extravagant when it comes to the... I mean, that's half the adventure up there is, is was finding all these spots, you know, because quite frankly, there's nothing written about them. No one knows anything about them. The state of Alaska is basically clueless. I mean, they rely on me for all the information they get. Um, and it's, you know, it's an adventure. It's the Wild West. It's like probably what the OP was, you know, 65, 70 years ago. It's, uh, it's basically untamed. So it's really nice uh, to get out there. Um, in the basically 10 years that I've been up there, I have yet to see one other person fishing <laughs> besides me, and that's in 10 years. So that's pretty good. And the only other footprint of a human that I ever saw was a, a local guy that called me and asked if he could go fish the creek. And I don't own the creek, but it was really nice of him to, to make sure I didn't have clients on it that day. So that's the only other human footprint I've even seen. So mm. it's basically an, a complete remote untapped thing. And off the grid for most people's uh, radar. So when you when you have to inev- inevitably switch those gears from those places in Alaska and come back to Bozeman to guide, um, it's a pretty major shift, not only probably personally, but, you know, in, in the way that you guide there in rivers around Bozeman. So what, you have any stories about making those transitions that um, kind of, you know, reflect on how you, how you personally do that? Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, so, that, tell us. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Coming out of Alaska and, and, and being in the remoteness of Alaska back to what I consider the big city, which is Bozeman, Montana, which I don't know if you guys have ever been in a, the Madison River in July, but it is a floating city going down the river. So it's a it's an extreme shock from those differences. I mean, I remember one of the times up in Alaska, for instance, uh, I was uh, running up one of the tricks and was looking for silver salmon and trying uh, some early runs in the fall uh, when I got done with uh, guide season here in Montana, and there was a black bear that was on an island, and it was the island I wanted to get to. So I walked up to the bear, and she started woofing at me and jumping on her front paws and popping her jaw. I was like, okay, well, I'll just go around and fish above her. So I walked about 100 yards out in the woods to go around, and she just paralleled me through the woods and headed me off in the woods going around. I was like, okay, I'll go the other way. So I waded back across the creek, went around the other side. She did the same thing. Finally, I had after about 45 minutes of a Mexican standoff with this beer, there's no way I'm getting by her. And so I couldn't figure out anything else to do. So I grabbed a stick, uh, probably about three inches around. I don't know, I could barely get my hands around it, probably five feet long. And I was within about 10 yards of her most of this time. She wouldn't let me get any further away from her and let me get by her at all. And I finally just let her have one right upside the head. And that was a little nerve-wracking when you have a, you know, 200-pound black bear that's wolfing, popping her jaws and bouncing on her front legs at you. And two sports looking on. Yeah, yeah. As it turns out, turns out the harder you hit them, the further they run away from you. So um, that was educational, if nothing else. But stuff like that that you just, you don't see in the lower 48. You know, that connection is that close to, close to, uh, a reality, I guess. When you come back here, by the time I get back to Bozeman, it's a lot like I might as well be in downtown Seattle. You know, it's it's every day, dawn till dusk, it's just going until fall. So when I get back from Alaska, I mean, it really is nonstop. I basically feel like I don't sleep for about three and a half, four months because it is it is such a small season in Montana as well, it seems. And it's uh, it's every day, and there's, you're not the only one out there. And that's one of the one things I really love about Alaska especially southeast, is you are the only one out there. So it's a complete polar opposite in those two different seasons, you know. One is you're competing with other guys, you're competing for water, you're competing who gets up the earliest, there's all this competition everything else. And up there, it's it's whatever I do. I mean, that's it. I'm the only one. So it's, it's it makes it – it goes from a little bit of a low-stress environment to a high-stress environment to a sense. But at the same point in time, you know, it's my bread and butter, too. I mean, trout, trout fishing is always going to be there no matter what. So I just uh, keep doing it. So – we had a, a guy on the show last week from the Madison River Foundation that, you know, to your point, trout fishing is always going to be there. There, there are people where you are that are, you know, working, and I'm assuming you are as well, working behind the scenes to make sure that that stays consistent. I just had this visual of you at the at the front of your boat waving that 
rod, like 18 little inner tubes coming downstream with coolers full of beer. <laughs> oh, yeah. So, that, oh. Go ahead. A little, little known fact that the Madison River tube hatch on the lower Madison, you know, when the water temps drop below about a bajillion degree, degrees, what they normally get to in, say, midsummer to late summer, that first cold snap you get that cools that water off. So you still have all the floaters, especially like that weekend right before MSU starts. That's one of my favorite times to float the lower Madison for two specific reasons. <laughs> one of which is the college girls that are in inner tubes that are just got back to college from a long summer, usually quite tan. You know, the weather's still nice enough to float and everything else, yet the water temps drop to the fish are eating, and those fish haven't seen pressure in a month and a half because it's been too warm to fish them. So none of the guys have touched it. So there's a there's a window of opportunity there that I like to say. So increased uh, both, scenery both, and yeah, increased scenery and great fishing at the same time. It's it's one of the it's a win win situation. Sign me up. Yeah. What when do we uh, book that trip? <laughs> yeah, that's a good point. Um, my strong is just going to that one. Uh, <laughs> that's usually like, find out when MSU starts and go about three, four, five days before it, or even a week after or two after, depending on how, how the weather goes. But look for a nice sunny day, preferably really warm. Saturdays are good. Put on about 10 o'clock in the morning. That's a good time to get started. Uh, so. My daughter's going to school in Montana in the fall. How about we choose someplace like Wyoming or Idaho, maybe? <laughs> well, well, I'll go somewhere else, then. I was aware of that. Let's go somewhere else. Or we could just do the Yak- Lower Yakima at the same too. time. Yeah, I mean, that'll, that'll work, too. Yeah, plenty of plenty of drunk girls floating the Yakima. <laughs> <laughs> so, mm. but you know, that being said, you know, I don't want to make Montana sound super busy. I think there's a lot of places that still have been off the grid here that uh, that people just fought out don't go fish. You know, most of which is because of low trout numbers. I mean, there's a lot of streams once you get further down in the water systems where they're not very, you know, biologically diverse, and there's very few trout. Um, and the water quality goes down, a lot of dewater and a lot of irrigation problems, you know, yeah. uh, runoff, pollution, stuff like that. And uh, I actually like fishing those spots a lot better because there's not enough trout there to keep other anglers there. But if you get intimate with a stretch of river like that, you'll learn the names of each trout that is there, and typically they're a lot bigger than the rest of them. And a lot of carp around too, right? <laughs> yeah, and, and everyone knows that I'm a carp fanatic. Um, <laughs> Goldfish. So, Kindred souls then, sweet. <laughs> yeah. So let's I like go. To think is, uh, I've created a new group in Montana called the Barbell Cowboys. So far, I'm the only member. But, uh, <laughs> I'm looking to expand. So. <laughs> the Barbell Cowboys. Nice. So let's yeah. go. Let's switch gears and go back to Alaska again because that that's fascinating to me as well. So you put an emphasis on you know leaving as little as trace as possible on the wild fish. I mean, you're targeting. You got multiple streams to target every day. Um, fish right yeah. out of the salt. Uh, that's the kind of trip that, you know, when, when you think about chasing steelhead, that's the kind of trip that people kind of dream about. Um, yeah. When if somebody comes up there and experiences that for the first time, how do you how do you prepare them for what they're about to encounter, and how do you decompress them so when they go back home they just don't have that same expectation? <laughs> <laughs> well, when, when, once you go, there's a – well, the first problem is, is once they go, the first thing out of everyone's mouth is, how does no one know about this? I mean, that's almost everyone says that. It's like, how does this exist? And it's not, why is there not 200 people here? I mean, it's one of the most amazing things that they've ever seen. And and when it comes right down to it, it's quite frankly, not a lot of people, A, talk about it, and B, the work it takes and the you know, years of dedication to find something like that is is unbelievable. But the biggest take-home thing for people when they come back is to look at an ecosystem and see when it, when it's managed properly, when it's not but it doesn't have all these different mismanagement programs going on with uh, netting, uh, logging, and all this other stuff. And, yeah, a lot of the stuff in Southeast has been logged. It was done a long time ago, and it was done a little better. And the, most of the systems have completely recovered from that. And they're such short, small gradient systems to begin with, they can heal a lot faster. And so when, when it's left in its natural state, it's really quite remarkable of what, what especially steelhead are able to do, you know, when man is not basically screwing them up <laughs> so are, are you seeing you know, the, yeah are you part. seeing any of the impacts uh you know we're, we're talking we've been talking a lot about dams and and suction dredge mining stuff do you see any of those impacts right now on the fish you go to or is it are you in pristine areas never never touched never touched i mean i've never seen this i mean the only scars and stuff on fish that we get are seal scars everything's got a giant adipose fin um there's just every one of them is completely pristine i mean the only thing Nature. I mean, you, every time you look at one, it's just something. And if, if it's got a mark on it, it's from nature. It's not from a, a net. It's not from you know, 
beating its head against concrete, rubbing its nose on a, a ladder going up a river. It's things of that nature. I mean, every one of them is just flawless. Mm. So if it has a mark, it's from another animal. <laughs> so you're you're, hook, you're hooking these fish within what type of distance from the salt? You know, we've even caught one in the salt. Uh, so I uh, I actually caught one dragging, <laughs> dragging an egg sucking leech. I was trying to straighten my line out before I got to the creek, so I was walking up, up the beach, dragging my line, letting it untwist, <laughs> and hooked one. Uh, that was a little bit interesting. So, uh, <laughs> but uh, typically, you know, the from high tide, um, a lot of times some of the fish, uh, the pools that we fish are actually tidal influx pools. So when the high tide comes in, the pool will literally fill up. Hmm. Um, and that's when you'll see some of the first fish come in, and they'll do circles. And as soon as it's, the tide just starts to fall, that's when the ones that are going to stay basically slide into the first holding slot, and the rest of them turn around and go back out. And that's your first chance to catch them. So as far as catching a fresh fish from the ocean, um, I don't think you can beat that. Yeah, and, uh, uh, if, you, if you pick them, they're salty. Yeah, the, so, Southeast Alaska steelheading has a reputation for uh, a lot of uh, red spawning, you know, tired fish. Oh, yeah. And so, you, you know, tell a little bit about, uh, I mean, obviously you're looking a little bit different, uh, a little bit different strategy, but there is a lot of a lot of uh, other type of operations that are doing that. You don't have to badmouth any of them, but anytime I tell people that I yeah. want steelheading in southeast Alaska, they go, oh, so you want gravel raping. <laughs> yes, yeah, you know, absolutely. That's, uh, that's the elephant in the room that always needs to come out, it seems. And, and it's not, you know... It, in southeast Alaska, the steelhead, there's such a short run, and they're, they come in basically sexually mature and ready to spawn from the ocean, unlike their counterparts in the lower 48, because they're such short systems, so they mature sooner. So you're going to get a darker fish in a couple of days. I mean, we can literally tell how many days that fish has been in fresh water just by the way it looks and acts. I mean, every day they change dramatically. So, I mean, it's not hard to get into those darker fish that are in spawn mode, but typically you have to go all the way up to the top edge of the systems. You know, I mean, we, we try to fish the very bottom mile is all, and that's and we literally target the fish that are coming in on that tide, because if you've ever hooked one of those compared to one that's a day old or two days old, it's, it's an absolute night and day, the difference between those fish. Mm. And, uh, you know, a lot of that reputation comes from rivers that have fish that move into them in the fall and over winter, too. Um, the Sea Tuck is an example of that. Um, a couple of ones on Prince of Wales, and those are the ones that are easily accessible, and those are the ones that most people have experience with. So that reputation has stemmed from some of the more popular spots that have a lot of fish that do move in and spend a fair amount of time in that fresh water. And that's a little more, I wouldn't say unique, but it's it's more common to see those kind of darker fish uh, in those spots, that, you know, that have fall runs that come into them, you know, that have fish trickling in and out of them all winter, where most of the shorter, smaller streams uh, you know, it's you have a five to seven day window where fish or steelhead even exist in that stream, and then they're gone. And mm-hmm. timing that and finding that is, is something special. It's an adventure in itself. So he, there's always going to be those rumors. There's always someone that's going to catch some fall fish out of you know Prince of Wales or up in the Sea Tuck or something like that. That's going to be really dark and posted on some blog and et cetera, et cetera. And so it's going to get that bad reputation. But I, mean, I can tell you from my personal experience, the only dark ones that we see are the ones way up in the headwaters if we go for a long, long hike. And, and I don't even let you cast at them. So yeah, we're, we're targeting a specific fish. And if it's not there, it's not there. And that's just the way it is. And that's fishing. Kudos to you for that. That's awesome. Um, last question that I've got is who's, you know, from someone who's heard this and looked at your website and they want to come up and fish, what's the skill level they got to be at? What kind of gear do they need? I mean, what's the kind of guy that comes up there that, um, that's prepared for what you have, you can, um, you, you can provide for them. And do they need to bring their own blindfold? <laughs> <laughs> GPSs are not allowed. Um, your smartphone doesn't get service up there, so you don't have to worry about that. Um, it does in town. Um, the one thing, you know, that uh, turns a lot of people on and off about it is how small these streams are. We use a lot of single-hand rods. You know, so the, two-hand, the two-handed crowd is uh, basically going to be a little bit turned off about it. But because of the small water and how steep the gradient is, it's almost impossible to get above the fish without spooking them. Uh, most of my clients to, that have been to New Zealand trout fishing compare the, my place up there to small stream New Zealand trout fishing for 15-pound chrome by right steelhead that are an hour old from the salt. Mm. So that's, you know, the biggest or the closest thing I can explain to how it goes up there. But we use a lot of 10-foot rods, a lot of roll casts, very little overhand casting. It's basically single-hand spay casting and roll casting. 
tight quarters, tight canyons. You got rock cliffs. You got Devil's Club. It's everything behind you. It's thick. It's nasty. It's tough. Um, not anyone can do it. Uh, I turn down groups, group after group after group every year. You know, when I, I run them through the grill on their physical abilities, it's like we're going to hike. You know, anywhere from two to five miles a day in some of the gnarliest country there is. But that's what it takes to get to these fish, and that's a, you know another reason why a lot of people aren't doing it is because the physical effort needed to get into these spots is pretty extreme, and that's half the fun too. You know, it's an adventure in itself, just getting up to a fish to find one. Um, mostly sight fishing. Uh, we do a lot of indicator fishing. If you want to use an indicator, you don't have to. You can use without an indicator. There are a few spots we can get above them and swing them. And they use one part just fine, just like any other steelhead, which is great. Um, but the chances that you get above it without spooking it are usually pretty slim, although in, in the rare instance, it can't happen. Uh, we, we have got one on a mouse. Um, we found a pack of about eight one time that just came in off the salt. And I was standing above them as they came in. I went, you know what, let's try something different before we do anything else. And I skated a mouse over the top of a Moorish mouse, and one kind of rose up out of the pond, got close to it, went back down, I threw it again. Got up a little closer, threw it back down. Got up again, he nosed it, threw it back down. <laughs> threw it one more time, and finally he grabbed onto it, and then I broke the fish off. But, nice. You know, it was still pretty pretty, pretty mm. exciting. So yeah. I understand that you're also, at, you know, at the end of that day when someone's tired and from catching fish all day and all that hiking, that you're also a, a, an accomplished chef. Is that right? Uh, do you want now? Sorry? I understand you're also oh, an accomplished chef. Is that right as well? Oh, yeah, I do a little cooking. Yeah, I do a little cooking. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, on the way back, at the end of the day, we usually stop pull crab and shrimp pots, uh, you know, and whatever other articles you would like to eat for dinner. Um, I'm a big fan of, uh, of, of killing what you eat. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I, uh, although I have no formal training, I am uh, I, I do like food a lot, and therefore uh, I have, uh, I guess, wound myself into being a pretty good chef. Although it helps when you have the absolute freshest things you can ever possibly eat, too. That makes it, uh, makes it a little bit easier. So a lot of them do go dig butter clams, you know, depending on uh, most guys when they get up there, they say that they can't get enough Dungeness crab. Well, they only crab till they're blue in the face. Well, on day three, they're usually blue in the face. So, uh, <laughs> How tired of shrimp and crab are you by the end of this trip? You know, I'm not. Uh, for some reason, it's never gotten old on me. One of my other guys that works for me up there, Ryan Brewer, he, uh, he makes this thing called crab butter soup. You know, he'll forego the uh, shrimp curry, coconut shrimp curry and things of like that for crab butter soup some nights where he basically shucks and deshells uh, three Dungeness crab, puts them in a giant bowl, and melts a stick of butter on it and eats the whole thing with a fork. So <laughs> typically how he starts his guide season. See, about you also At the end of it, he's begging yeah. for a hamburger. <laughs> he gets laid out. I never do. Uh, you know, I mix it up so much with, with you know, different ways to eat seafood that it, it really never gets old because, you know, jambalaya is, is quite a bit different than, you know, shrimp on a skewer. So it's like, you know, when you're mixing mixing a different stuff, a bunch of stuff up, it makes it pretty easy not to get tired of it. So I never do. It uh, it sounds awfully remote and therefore um, squatchy. Any sightings? Ooh, that's a great question. Oh, you know, you, not, that's a very, very good question. Not yet, but I'm still optimist or uh, optimal about it. This should It should happen any time. So you believe... Believe. So I believe. Yeah. Oh, of course there's. I mean, yeah. if they're anywhere, mm. I mean, I can take one step and be behind a tree, and you don't know where I'm at. So I mean, right. they can do the same. Thing. Yeah. So. so we've alluded a little bit to the accessibility issues and kind of hit points here and there on it. Kind of break it down from getting to the dock at the marina to the end of the day. What what does somebody expect? You know, as far as getting there, getting to the spot where the fish are, and getting back. What what all is involved? Yeah, okay, so the typical day, we start out, uh, you know, 5 or 6 in the morning. Some guys like to sleep in a little more than, than others. But we usually, I usually get up about 5, we'll have breakfast, have a full breakfast at the lodge before taking off, down to the dock by 7 o'clock in the morning, 8 o'clock right in there. And then most of our streams are under an hour away. We have uh, a couple that are a little over an hour. But So the morning, basically, you're, we'll travel out across the ocean. We'll drop uh, two clients and one guide off at one stream, and then we'll go and go to another stream with the other two clients and guide and fish for anywhere from six to ten hours, depending on how long you can handle it. Uh, then meet back at the boat, uh, head back to the dock, pull crab and shrimp pots, usually back to the house, you know, right around dark sunset, uh, cook dinner, start up, do it all over again. Uh, lunches, usually we'll either do a sack lunch, you know, on the river, up the river, or we have chowder and hot lunch on the boat as well uh, Some for some days uh, as well, especially the cold days that are a little rainy. We'll try to have hot lunch right waiting. So when you get back to the boat at the end of the 
uh, fishing, you'll get hot lunch, and we'll go pull a crab and shrimp off, and then motor back to the to the harbor. So that's a typical day. Uh, a lot of guys say I only like fishing for you know at least ten hours, and et cetera, et cetera. Um, so far since I've done this, very few guys can make it that long. In, in, con- in contrast, yeah, today we have zero seafood in the. In contrast, today we have zero seafood sitting in front of us. So. I'm hungry now. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, a lot of guys really, really enjoy the crab and shrimp pot pulling as much as the skillet. I mean, they'll go and they'll get get their you know three fish a day or whatever is probably about what we average per client. And uh, you know, after that, their mind's blown. You know, it's like, okay, I just caught a steelhead within eyesight of the ocean. One of them ran back to the ocean. I've never fought one like this. It's hard. Everything on me is broken. We broke two rods. We smoked a reel. It's like, let's go do something else. <laughs> it's enough. I don't. I, I can't top that. <laughs> so there's a, there's a lot of that that happens. So it, it, it's pretty mind blowing the first the first time you get one of those those minute old fish from the salt water. I mean they're unlike you just you just can't catch a steelhead anywhere else in the world like that. They, there's not that opportunity, you know. Well, the Great Lakes maybe. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I said steelhead, not a natter. <laughs> I mean, at, at fluvial rainbows. At fluvial. I take it back. We have friends back in the uh, the Great Lakes, so I strike the comment from the record. <laughs> Quack. <laughs> right on. So, hey, yeah, back there too. It is fun, but you know, yeah. there's there's something about a something about a fish that actually lives its life in the ocean, not a big lake. So yeah. you'll be hanging out in Bozeman for what another month or so, and then headed up there for a short period, and then back in Bozeman for the summer, right? Yep, that's correct. Uh, I actually am in Bozeman here for about uh, a little less than a month. I go to Belize for a week, and then I go straight from there to Alaska, and then I'm in Alaska until the end of May, and then it's as soon as I get back to Montana, it's May through October. And you still have uh, some openings for this year's Chrome Chasers adventures, don't you? Yes, I do. I uh, actually, one of the April 20th through the 27th, I have a spot for uh, two guys. I have a couple that's coming up already that's been up here with me uh, before, and I'm um, looking to find another pair to go up with them if all possible. Yep. I, try, I can only take four people per week, and I try to book most of my weeks with individual groups. So four-person mm-hmm. groups is what I try to do. Um, this year, because the couples, you know, they, they keep coming back, and they're, they're coming back whether I like it or not, and they weren't able to find two of their own, I do have an opening for two, for yeah, two spots. Two highly sought-after, fought-over spots. Somebody should grab them. Yeah. There's three of us here. <laughs> I've already gone. You guys can do it. Sweet. Thanks, Evan. You're welcome. Corporate, yeah. corporate jet for Kirk and I. We'll be there. We'll be there. I don't know if Rick wants to put up with me for another week. <laughs> That's okay. It's, it, you got to work on that man, Evan. you got to stack man that. I don't, think I've, I don't think I've nymphed a fly rod since then. <laughs> I was scarred. I wasn't that hard on that. He's been too busy fishing gear. Yeah. <laughs> Center pinning. <laughs> Right. Yeah, yeah, that staple's easy button's kind of nice to hit every now and again. <laughs> <laughs> well, Rick, thanks a lot for sharing your stories today and talking about Alaska and Montana. I'm sure a lot of people are going to take a closer look at what you're doing there, and, and hopefully uh, you don't weed them out uh, completely because uh, sometimes a, a lot of heart goes into getting to a place like that, even though your body might not be willing or able. So, yeah. Thank yeah. you very so much. How can everybody go about uh, finding out more about what you do and contact you? What Tell them about your website. Yeah, my website is www.chromechasers.com. Uh, in Montana, it's uh, Montana Trout Fitters, so it's troutfitters.com. So it's www.troutfitters.com. Uh, my cell and emails are on both those websites. It's easy to get a hold of me usually uh, if I'm not stuck in the woods fighting some rare animal. Um, but, uh, yeah, those are the two best places to get a hold of me. You can call me direct, email me anytime. I'm usually pretty quick to get back to you on that. Uh, and then I think coming up, there might be some stuff in the works with uh, Yellow Dog as well. That cool. Make it kind of tough. Well, so your, your Chrome Chasers website looks outstanding. Yeah, I, some some guy built it for me. I created him <laughs> catching a skill set for it. Yeah. He had no idea what he was doing. Yeah. So. <laughs> he must have an awesome radio show. <laughs> this is sounding <laughs> rather <laughs> incestuous. This is sounding incestuous. Slightly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I suckered him into it. But, uh, yeah, check it out. There's a lot of information on the, the website. One thing I can stress to people is read the About page. I know it's long. It looks like there's a lot of information there. You might just skim over. But it's really important that you look and see. It, it gives a good outline of, of what we're trying to accomplish and what we do up there. And it makes it a lot easier for you to think, is this trip for me, you know. So, 
So it that's is physically interesting, and it takes a special person to, to, to understand and appreciate it. That's on the About page, or for our Canadian yeah. viewers, the Boot page. The Boot page. Mm-hmm. The boot page. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Cool. All right, Rick. I think that's about it. Derek, yeah, thank you, you very much again. It's a pleasure. Okay, thank you guys very yeah. much. All right, bye bye. That does sound super fascinating. I think oh, I'd yeah. like to go to Alaska. Yeah, it's pretty ridiculous. I I was watching one of the I don't know if it was uh, seasons on the fly or something, and there was it wasn't Rick's program, but it was a uh, somewhat. Similar. I think I know who it is. I mean, I haven't seen the show, but there's another uh, another. Was it on like a houseboat? Yeah, yeah, yeah. In fact, we Rick and I uh, went onto that boat. It, it was in the the town that he's based out of. They came by and were docked there, and Rick knows them, so we went down there and, and had dinner and had some beers on the boat with them. Yeah, they were so. fishing, you know, small water with single handed rods. And mm-hmm. yeah, they uh, they fish closer to like Sitka and stuff like that. They, there's a lot of uh, stream stuff over there that they they do. But yeah, these streams are about as remote as you can get. I mean, he takes that boat through the fjords and. And everything just way back far away from any kind of human anything and anchors up we jump in a dinghy or a a a sled for one of them and motor up to the mouth of the creeks and then hike up i mean it's so how how big a boat is it that you take from the dock it's like 35 33 35 feet and he tows the sleds behind him yeah uh yeah it's a big twin engine boat and that's kind of what he was saying you know just not anybody is going to go up and find these streams i mean it it took him years because there's a bunch of these little streams up there and not all of them have much of a run of fish and so he spent years going into all these streams and investigating them at different times and, and everything and you know trying to get his permits and a lot of the streams that he tried to get permits for to guide the state was like there's no there's no steelhead run in there <laughs> and wink so he's like okay give me a dolly permit or something you know just some something to get me in there so that the, the state of they're so remote and hard to find and so little is known about them that the state of alaska like he was saying just doesn't even know that they're there maybe we need a uh, an open flight podcast helicopter as well I'm 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 okay with that. Yeah, we were we've already we're we're paying off the jet now. Sweet. Yeah. Let's do it. I, I mean, a chopper's nice because that gets you into you know really tight spots. But I've I've always wanted a, a beaver. <laughs> yeah, to, to Haviland. That yeah, that could get you pretty close. What color to these? Oh, bright yellow. Bright yellow beaver. Huh. Yeah, that could get you relatively close to some of these streams. So. Let's do it. All right. Well, no one's got a big brown beaver, but I don't know about a yellow one. <laughs> All right, moving on. Uh, so yeah, I, quack. Yeah, I I went in uh, with Rick in 2011. I built his website for him, and well, you know we worked out a deal, deal, a discount deal for me to get up there with him. Otherwise, I'd never been able to pull it off because I'm poor. But uh, yeah, it was a life changing experience to see that. Just seeing how steelhead behave when they're in an environment where they're not being uh, pressured and beaten on every day just to see the difference in behavior, you know, same fish and everything. And I, I, I can imagine that that's how the steelhead down here used to behave before they were getting run over by boats and, and fish to, uh, all the time. So it was really interesting to see how they, how they behave. Yeah. Well, our behavior is all affected by pressure. Yes. You know, like right now I'm feeling really pressured you look and very pressured me too i'm also feeling very pressured so yeah it's it, you know even if you don't do it in one of his openings this year it's something everybody sh- can experience uh, should go experience sometime if they if they can because he's one of the only guys doing the type of operation that he's doing there's a couple other ones uh guiding steelhead in the southeast but most are doing something li- doing a little different uh not co- entirely the same thing so i really highly suggest talking to rick it's it's very much worth your time tell him you heard about it here and we'll receive absolutely nothing nope not really. Yeah, we don't we don't have a deal with him yet. Let's go to break. All right, fine. Time, time. out. All right, going to break now. Uh, when we come back, we're going to talk about uh, an issue that it's kind of surprising that it, it's dam uh, dam dams going up in a time that we're celebrating all these dams being removed. There's uh, proposals out there for new dams on rivers that do not currently have them that are designated. Uh, what, what's the word? I don't know. They got protection. Wild and scenic. Yeah, all that. Uh, so, yeah, the whole dam issue is far from over. So uh, stay tuned and uh, join us after break for that. For dam. Damn it. Dam. Damn. Yep, damn it. Damn. All right. 
This is the Open Fly Podcast. We will be right back. Now back to the Open Fly. All right, we have on the line Andrea Matsky, the president of Wild Washington Rivers. Andrea, thanks for coming on with us. It is absolute. It's an absolute pleasure. I I love you guys. Our pleasure. <laughs> mm-hmm. Great. All right. So uh, obviously, there's a lot going on uh, with uh, Wild Washington Rivers, uh, specifically with the Skykomish River, which is coincidentally down the street from the Open Fly Podcast up, studio. Up, up the up the street from the up the road. Up in the, the road. General, in the general it, it, area. I guess it is a road, not a street. Yeah. Uh, from the yeah. Open Fly Studios and. Uh, our home waters actually it's where uh, i do a lot of my fishing close to home so tell us about what's going on up there right now well it's a little crazy but uh there is a proposal to put a new hydropower dam on the skycomish river in the sunset falls area which if you if, if you don't know the area if you're driving out on highway 2 and you're going east toward Stevens or, or, or wherever you go east. Toward. Leaven, Leavenworth. Leavenworth, yes. Um, by uh, the town of Index, around mile marker 36 or so, you, you see, you know, you see this gorgeous stretch with these mountains, uh, Mount Index and, and Mount Persis. They're they're you know just towering over you, and so the Sky River runs kind of parallel to highway two and there are you can you can see it in a couple places but if the um it just down you know just like a, a little bit um i guess if you're heading east to you know to the right there are uh forest service roads and stuff that will take you to the most spectacular vistas that you've ever seen it's just they're unbelievable so um Sounds like a, pr- a pristine area. Yeah, well, it's pristine now. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, and you had and, mentioned and, that it uh, currently there's a, a status on that river that's that they're trying to lift for this to happen. What, tell us a little bit about what's uh, about that. Oh yeah, great question. Um, well, okay, so the the, um, the the South Fork of the Skykomish is is the area, and and Sunset Falls is one of the like three waterfalls in that, the, just the same little area that is, it's got a number of, of protections. Um, in 1977, because people were looking at it as a potential dam site, the um, Washington State started a scenic rivers program, and it was based on the Skykomish River. Out of the South Fork Skykomish River. So what that did on the state level is protect it from hydropower development. Now, there in 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 the entire Washington State there are four rivers with that status, and that's the South Fork of the Skykomish, and then the Tie and the uh, and the Foss, which are tributaries of the Skykomish, and then uh, Little Spokane. So doesn't the Lower Klickitat River have that as well? Uh, no, um, it, it it could have a Northwest Power and Conservation Council protection, but oh, I know um, it's designated like wild and scenic. I didn't know if that was the same. Oh, you, you know what? That there that so that's that's a good question. That's a that's a the difference is so state scenic waterway is a Washington state designation, but wild and scenic is a federal designation, uh-huh. and and they and the the federal licensing pro process they they can override state law and you know and, and have been but they have to back off when it's a federal protection or they're they're supposed to gotcha so tell us a little bit about this specific dam project um what is it that they are proposing to do exactly uh, what type of dam uh what are its implications what what kind of uh things can we see expect to see on the river after it's after it's put on well Okay, so what they want to do is they they want to put uh, what's what they argue is not a dam; it's a weir. But it, you know, go to Webster and see what Webster says a, a weir is, and um, and they want to they want to put 
they want to put this dam in critical habitat of three endangered um, species that, that the um, North, uh, the uh, Puget Sound steelhead, the Chinook, and the bullhead, or um, bull trout, Dolly Varden. Char. Uh, Char. <laughs> L- um, let me interrupt for a second, Andrea. Yeah. When, when you say they want to put this in, are we talking about the Canadians, the Chinese, the Dutch? Who wants to do this? Oh, yeah. That's a the, good, d- yeah. the Dutch or Phoenicians, one so of those. <laughs> <laughs> um, they is um, Snohomish County PUD. And the P in PUD is supposed to be public util- you know, for public utilities district, but that's a mystery unto itself. So when what's interesting about this is um, Snohomish County PUD attempted this project in 1981, and they spent over two years with NOAA and NIMPS and all state and federal fisheries services spending our tax dollars, I know they spent mine, studying this. And it was found, the location was found infeasible for hydropower because the, that, that run has seven an, anadromous or migrating uh, species, uh, including, you know, Chinook coho, um, steelhead, river spawning sockeye, um, dolly varden, uh, uh, um, you, you know, so there's, it's a pretty, it's a, it's a pretty uh, prolific river for fisheries. And so when the, um, when Sonoma County PUD tried this in 81, you know, NOAA, NIMS, the Department of the Interior, they all filed motions to, to say you, this is not the right place because if you take enough water to make energy then you're not going to leave enough for the fish passage and the fish have to get down too serious at the falls and they need that flow to cushion their the survival rate so when Somers County PUD tried this in 81 they finally withdrew their, their permit and then another company tried to do it in 85, and they just looked at the studies, and they said, oh, oops, you know, we're not, we're not going there. And then in 1991, Tacoma Public Utilities tried to do it, and, and they were kind of, you know, slapped up the side of the head with, with Noah coming in and saying, we've studied this, we've already found it infeasible, and, and to paraphrase, you're wasting our time and you're wasting your money. So what's and, changed? Like why are they why now is it why now are they are they getting serious about trying this? Well, I'll tell you, the guy who tried to do it in uh, in 91 is the same guy who's now the general manager of of Snohomish County PUD. Funny how so, that works. Yeah. So we have um a whole number of theories, but uh you know, our state, um, our state government and our, and our federal government, we're unfunded right now. We're kind of broke. <laughs> so the, the scenic waterways system, while it's still on the books, they have no one to enforce it. And, you know, what's also a little interesting is, is the Department of Ecology and the Department of Fish and Wildlife, who would be the people to say, you know, Oh no! You know what? We control the flows. We control the aesthetics. We control the fish. They're they're the ones we we count on to come in and say, you you can't do that. But it's interesting where most of their budget comes from. Hydro licensing. Hmm. So so we're running into conflicts of interest here and there. Let me uh, play devil's advocate for a minute. Uh, there's probably a a whole population of people listening today or maybe not um that have no familiarity with this proposed project and they hear they hear the term weir 
and they they understand what that is and they say well that's you know that's a, a temporary device it's inflatable it's not a concrete structure um let's clear up exactly what this particular project proposes as far as the weir and any other environmental impact and, aspects and, and let us know a little bit about if it creates a reservoir or anything of that sort we're not talking about bob weir of the grateful dead are we well we could okay <laughs> um yeah that's a great question okay so um, what what they're saying, uh, you know, it's a, it, oh, it's just a weir. They, um, sometimes they call it a floating weir, which is inaccurate because a floating weir is what they use to clean up oil spills. And so, they, it, but it, it it's true it's an inflatable weir. But it is anchored in 230 feet of cement, of concrete, which they will have to, they'll have to, Create a coffer dam in, and again, let me rephrase, in critical habitat of three ESA-listed species. And to install this 230-foot concrete structure in order to place their inflatable weir into. And the, and the weir itself, um, they can raise it in order to to create a little bit of a reservoir. And it's, it's only like a two-acre reservoir at, at, at tops. But what it would do is it would channel the river, d- divert it from 1.1 miles of, uh, of migration path of seven, of seven very, very popular species of migrating fish. And take the water from that and, and then blast through half of a mile of, of granite and what else, whatever else they find along the way to um, the base of Sunset Falls, which in essence would dewater Canyon Falls, which is spectacular, but it's a really jagged falls. And, and, and the fish need that, that cushion. And then Sunset Falls, which, uh, again, the fish need the cushion of the flow, but it, it's also it, it's a spectacular sight. So what, what people don't understand, and, and, and it took me a while, because I didn't understand this when I started, but the weir, while weirs have a whole, wow, just I've got all these NOAA documents about how weirs fail and... and all of the, um, all, you know, they're just not a reliable source uh, to keep, uh, fit, you know, to keep uh, water back and and for, and for fish protection. But that's not the problem. They they want to. They've got all these fish screens that they intend to dynamite an underground cavern, and the dimensions are such that when you see them in comparison to the to the inside of Seahawks Stadium, they take up almost the entire stadium. So, and this this isn't this isn't the intake chamber you're talking about. That is the intake chamber. That, oh, yes, okay. You. Yeah, and the intake chamber then then, then connects to um, a, what's called a penstock or a or a diversion tunnel, which is half of a mile long underground to divert the river, and and this. This is 19 feet in diameter. So if you compare it to two freeway lanes wide and two stories tall, that, that it'd be, uh, someone calculated 44 billion pounds of uh, granite that they would have to remove in order to create this. And then it would go to, so, that, so now this, the pristine Skykomish River would go to, the base of Sunset Falls bypassing the falls into their turbines mm. and create an infinitesimal amount of power that we can't even use in the Northwest because it's, it's I don't know if you know the difference between runner river dams and, and regular dams, but um, you know, runner river has no storage, so if you don't use it, you lose it. And this would only make 
well, it would, it would make power, I mean, it would be closed in the summertime, which would be our second highest demand. Um, it would be only slightly operational in, in the winter, and in the fall is, is where the big payoff is. And the problem is we already have too much, we have so much energy in the fall, we pay wind farms not to operate. So yeah. how does that work? Andrea, this is um, this is Derek. I've also been kind of watching this a similar type project on the North Fork of the Snoqualmie for a couple of yeah. years now, and yeah. I've been to all of the most of the meetings where you know the, the design is talked about, and and there's intake from the community that's you know from all the different user groups, the kayakers, the fly fishermen, the hikers, you know, all of that, um, and the discussion always comes down to it seems like that. These places, these dams are always proposed in the most beautiful of places that have happen to have fish in them. Uh, how do we shift the discussion away from these dams are always being targeted in places that are that are beautiful that have wild fish in them? How do we how do we get these companies if they want to provide hydropower and build these things to be looking at places that are ugly and desolate of fish? Um. Well, you know what the 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 question in in general to ask in my opinion because i i was at the north fork skycomish or snoqualmie uh, scoping meeting and i've talked to the black canyon guys who are who are behind that project um who by the way think it this the amount of money they're trying to spend on the skycomish is just absurd um but n- I, it, I'm not anti-hydropower because we have so much hydropower in the state. We have like 80, 85% of the energy in our state comes from hydropower. So we've got all these dams on the Columbia. We've got, you know, all, all these other dams that um, the there was the intention of the voters – uh, voted in I-937, which is the Clean Energy Initiative. And it says you cannot use fresh water to power for a power generation source. So the question about why we are pursuing hydro in a state that already gets 80-ish, 80, 85% of their power from hydro is the question to be asking. The, the, there's because it, like I said, especially these non-reservoir dams, they don't store it. They can't store it for when we need it. Well, and to so, the point, these these little small these small dams are expected to generate, uh, you know, ten. I don't know the exact power voltage, but you know, ten megawatts of power, which essentially is enough for what 110, 120 homes. So, yeah, there there well, and further is the point: is are we we're generating little power stations for uh, for building homes in places that we already have a pretty good access to hydro in. That's exactly right. It, that, that, no, that's exactly right. And, and the, um, like, for instance, with Snohomish County PUD, they're, you know, they've got this Young's Creek uh, hydro project. And as it turns out, you know, they can, they, the power that they create on, and it's just this little tiny thing, very minimal producer, but it, it produce it generates power at nine cents a kilowatt hour, but the market only bears three cents a kilowatt hour. So, oh, okay, so we're making we're minus six cents every kilowatt hour. So what do we do? We make more. That's so, like government math. They, <laughs> I know. <laughs> that that becomes the problem is the math. So, yeah. So what Snopa did in 2012 is they filed with the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, which is FERC for um, you know us friendly with them, and they said, "Gosh, we're not making any money of that of this." In fact, in 2012, we lost 1.6 million dollars on this tiny little project. And um, so we would like to file for um, an exemption for ha- to having to pay certain fees, which means that 
they don't want to pay, so Kirk is going to pay for it with his tax dollars, and and so am I, and and Derek and everyone. We're paying for their bad business strategy with our tax dollars. How come Evan doesn't have to pay? <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm not particularly honest with my taxes. I was oh. going to say, wait, this is unfair. Well, I'm, 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 a, I'm, a, I'm a cash owner. I guy. protest. <laughs> this is unfair. <laughs> yeah. so, so this whole thing, I mean, the numbers don't add up. It, no. it It's not friendly to the environment. Why is it still an issue? Or why do we still have to uh, fight this thing? Well, that, that's always the question, but... Uh, but because um, somebody has uh, something I, to profit somewhere, money. Well, money. Follow the money. Mm-hmm. Um, so you know, and 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 just as an anecdote, uh, because because um, the Young's Creek power was produced, although they in their application they said it was for you know the badly growing power needs of the district, uh, which is the Snohomish County district, but there there is no demand for it, so they got licensed to sell it to California. And so I asked, I asked point blank the Snohomish County PUD, are they planning on selling this power to California? And the answer was yes. <laughs> Did we talk about this that last was. week? <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, and I, I think, uh, and another thing, I don't really know how, you know, the uh, this weir would look or anything, but a lot of these projects, you know, they, everybody knows about the fish passage issues and all that, but... There's other downstream implications as well. It, it obstructs uh, the, the flow of timber and things like that that create natural log jams and, and other things that the river needs for, for fish habitat downstream. So there, it's something that's often not talked about. Do you think this weir would also uh, have those kind of implications as well? Oh, yeah. Okay. Um, uh, absolutely. And, and well, what, one of the things that they, they – um, it's it's a little, it's a little crazy, but I, I, I'm you guys you know um, what the copper having copper in a salmon stream. Are you familiar with the uh, what that issue is? Copper River mm-hmm. salmon from Alaska? Yeah, I've, I've, no. I've been marketed such things. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, it's funny because I was at a this. Um, it's a seminar that that's put on every once in a while. It's a continuing environmental legal seminar um, put on by a, a number of, of these groups, and it's all these environmental attorneys talking about you know uh, about what's going on now, and and guest speakers are there, and and the Commissioner Goldmark of the DNR was uh, one of the speakers, and he was explaining how how copper. Um, is is lethal to salmon because it jams their sense of smell. So even a teeny tiny amount of copper in in the river makes them unable to detect predators, and it also interferes with their ability to find their way back to their spawning beds um, or back back to their well yeah their spawning beds. So. We are spending many billions of dollars getting the copper out of Puget Sound right now. And this project would be, which in essence, when these, these dams, these you know, mini dams or micro dams, they're mines. They're, they're dig, they're, because they have to dig through, uh, you know, sometimes an enormous amount of, of uh, granite or whatever their, you know, whatever the, the substrate is. And and this area in, in Sunset Falls is called the Copper District. And that's because there are about 20 copper mines just in the, in the nearby vicinity. So, um, and I have, I have these studies by the um, U.S. Forest Service because the Forest Service is in charge of these um, Superfund uh, toxic cleanup sites where old mines, which were abandoned, are still leaching copper, lead, cadmium, high levels of arsenic, 
all these very toxic chemicals into the river. And we're wondering why our, our salmon counts are down. Well, and they're not expecting that drilling this huge tunnel through the the bedrock around the falls wouldn't release a lot of these heavy metals? Well, uh, the we had one of the the citizens uh, in our in our area someone way smarter than me uh, started doing the research and he submitted the research to uh St. Thomas County PUD and they kind of like eh whatever and and the research states that this area is you know is full of arsenic lead copper all these um all, all these highly toxic heavy metals, and so when they when when the PUD ignored it, he filed uh, the study request with the federal government, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, and they and so they they kind of hemmed and hawed, and they said, okay, you guys need to do a, a mineral study, which which you know. And, and it's it's not like these guys don't know about what's going on in in the, in the area. So they submitted a mineral study, and they listed all these minerals except copper. So you know if you so so I brought that to their attention, and they and so then they had to redefine it to include copper. And why was had, co- why was copper excluded? Was it an oversight? Um, I'm going to say no, because it was excluded, because if you're testing for copper and you find copper, then you can't continue with your project unless you go, because that, that, that makes you subject to all these other tests. Well, and, if you're not looking for it, you won't find it. Um, <laughs> yeah, well... Yes, I mean, there, if you go down the Sky Commerce River, right where they want to put the the dam, you, I mean, there are copper flakes. Uh, you know, there's like gold flakes and copper flakes that you can just pull. Gold. You know, you can, mm. So, yeah, it, yeah, high value. That brings a little bit of a, another question. Of it's a slightly different tangent, but right now there's also a big, uh, big discussion going on around uh, the sensible use of suction dredges on Washington rivers. And, and one yeah. of the, one of the pros for being, you know, the ability to do that is that you're taking harmful metals out of the stream beds. But what gets lost in the discussion is that if you, as far as I know, suction dredge a stream bed, you take, put you're, pretty much, you're taking all of that habitat away from fish that return year after year after year to go find that place to spawn. So unless you're replacing these things, you know, replacing the stream beds with, the way they were before you disturbed them, mm-hmm. that's an extractive industry that has impacts on, on, on fisheries. Absolutely. And, and when, you, when you do that, you also stir it up. You know, this, after a while, you know, the, the sediment, it, 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 you know, it stays. I mean, the, whatever is leaching out, it's leaching out. But when you start to, to stir it up during these dredgings, the same thing is is you just you you reactivate all of the harmful heavy metals. So, Andrea, the the question that comes to mind is going to it's going to be in our listeners' minds is that we're talking about how harmful it is to get these minerals and and these metals out of the ground and how to stop those things. But yet we need those metals for the fly reels, for the stripping guides on our fly rods the metal in our trucks and our cars to get back and forth in the river, the frames in our boats, plates in our head, plates in our head, stuff like that. <laughs> you know, the, the copper, you know, the copper wire that we use to make our copper John flies that sometimes get, get lost in the water. So how, how as fly anglers and anglers in general, how, how do we, how do we respond to this in terms of, do we think that all of these things are bad despite we need the resources or, it, where's the where's the um, where's the middle ground? I guess where's the common ground? Oh well, um, you know, and, and uh, that's that's just another really good point because we do need this stuff. Um, we we make a yeah. lot of good points here. We're uh, that's that's the point of the open fly. We're we can be smart sometimes. Uh, well, that's actually 
the dumbest point you've made so far. <laughs> Ooh. <laughs> uh, nice. So you don't, you know, you. The, I'm not saying don't mine the stuff. I'm saying don't mine it on on a, a protected river with seven species of, of fish that you're, you you want to catch, but you now you got your rods, but you don't got the fish. Let me uh, let me ask you a question, Andrea. Um, why you? Why do you care? Why did you take this on as a as a personal fight? You know, um, give us a little intel about your connection to all this. Yeah. Uh, when I was a kid, uh, my Kate, grandpa- can I get a compliment for a good question? <laughs> oh, yeah. You know what? Good job, Kurt. Thank you. You actually not only you, do you get a compliment for a good question. Um, you get a compliment for being so supportive and and caring and showing up and and getting the word out because um, you know there is a multi million dollar uh, advertising campaign funded by Summers County PUD to make us all think that this is a great project. So um, many many accolades to Kirk. I mean, huge influencer in and in getting people aware of what's really going on. Well, I think you give me too much credit, but I'll take it. Um, <laughs> I, I think um, no, basically, I think everybody that that can has to lend a voice, and whatever your vehicle for communication is, you know, every every little bit helps, and that's that's all I see that I've done is just help disseminate and share information. Well, you know what, and, and showing up to these meetings and, and things like that, you know, that, that support, because we're, we're all volunteers. We're all, we're, we're doing that, this at our own expense. I mean, I quit a very high-paying job at, and to start this, uh, to, to fight this, and I haven't made any money in two years. But I am so passionate about it because it's, it's just so wrong. So going back to your original question is um, I grew up fishing on the Skycomish River when my uh, my you know, grandfather had a cabin up there. And, you know, the you know, my dad and brother and grandfather would go out fishing because that's what the boys did. So I would sneak. Well, in it is a man's the- endeavor. It's what? It's a man's endeavor, this fishing yeah, yeah. thing. <laughs> yeah, no, I. It, it totally. I, I mean, I got. I got that. Um, but you know, the the alternative was to make cookies with my grandmother, who is half deaf, and and <laughs> would always say say. And I, you know, so I. So what I would do is I would sneak into my grandfather's um, uh, um, workshop, and I would take monofilament, and I would tie it to a stick. And I would, you know, put some little lead, you know, little anchors on, and I, I would dig worms, and I would sit by the on the bank of the Skykomish, and I would catch fish, however I could, you know, like from the age of eight on, and, and you know, as I progressed, I, you know, I, I started to to do a lot of other kind of fishing, and then when I got hooked on fly fishing, no pun intended, I. It's always uh, funny though. No. <laughs> Um, I, you know, I, I started, uh, you know, uh, fly fishing in, and just in, in this area, and, you know, and I like, like Christmas Island and other places. So yeah, just Christmas uh, Island, <laughs> no big deal. Oh yeah, it was, it was pretty fun actually. So, um, but one of the things that I know from growing up on that river is that you cannot put anything in that river because of the the protected species if your cabin or home is falling into the river from erosion or or whatever you can't put cement to um, secure it that you can't do that and there's a few homes that are precariously close to the uh the (laughs) where the the river is cutting in Especially in that oh, upper yeah. river, there's a couple of them. You can tell they got a couple of years left at most. Right. Yeah, I know the, the, the channel is changing, which is it's, it's kind of a bummer. Yep. But uh, and that has to do with upstream logging and development and all that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. But um, but 
when I, you know, I was working at like the second biggest ad agency in the world in, in Hollywood when I got a call from one of my neighbors saying, you know, why aren't you commenting on this stuff? And I said, like, on what stuff? And they said, the the dam that they're proposing on the Sky River. I'm thinking, what? So I uh, quit my job and I moved back here because it it has a, a personal connection to me. I, I ended up buying my grandfather's place um, through a, a, a great hassle and, and, I, and I, you know, I bought it at the top of the market, but I was living in L.A. I couldn't use it. And I had this sense that Washington was always going to preserve its beautiful areas and that we were salmon people and we, and, you know, outdoor recreation. And when I heard about this, it just, it in, incited me to want to, to have to come up and do something about it. So, um, and, and since I've been learning about all of the uh, implications for this river, I started looking into other rivers like the North Fork Snoqualmie, and and there are there are a lot of rivers that need people to say, hold on, this, you know, the economy that these rivers create in in outdoor recreation, fishing, commercial fishing, whitewater rafting, the Skykomish alone was just evaluated at three, between three hundred and forty five million and three point three billion dollars in revenues. Per year, for uh, you know, for fishing recreation industries. So, so you know, I, I I think that some some personal gains by somebody is is hurting us all. And and I and I just Sky Commons is, is where we start, but there are a lot of there are a lot of rivers that really need people to advocate for them. We agree. Yeah, yeah. Well, and you were that one person that really stepped up in this case and led the charge. And I think a lot of people out there are sympathetic to different causes of this nature, but they, for whatever reason, they just don't get involved. And and that's the key is you got to get involved to help. Yeah. How can how can people get involved through your organization? Well. Um... Thank you. That's a great question. Thank I, you. I, um, <laughs> um, I actually I, I had a website up, but somehow it got hacked when I started getting um, press. So I've got a new website up, and there's a contact. We need help. We, we really need help. We need people to write letters to the editors. We need, to, we need people to write letters to Jay Inslee, to uh, Suzanne Del Benny. I mean, I was told that that ten letters will in, get somebody in, a, in in the legislature to take action. And someone sent the local um, the thirty ninth legislative district, which is where the, the project is, sent the senator Pearson a, a letter, and he said, "Can you get nine more?" And that was easy. And Senator Pearson is actively against this project. Like he and I co-wrote a, um, a, um, a, an opinion piece in the Herald the other couple weeks ago with uh, Laura Cox, my other partner in crime in, in Wild Washington Rivers. And the more people who know about this, um, there, right now that there is a comment period for the Northwest Power and Conservation Council, and and that's a federal government, a federal body. And and if people write into into the um, to comment on wanting to keep the protections on this river, on the North Fork Snoqualmie River, which is also protected, um, that speaks volumes. I mean, people just you know they they can help. They can they can send you know they can. They can donate money, so you know we can continue to put video out and 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 sh- and do these presentations. They can write letters. They can volunteer. There are a million easy ways to help, and I'm I'm 
would be thrilled to, um, to, to you know, embrace anybody's efforts in any way they want to help. Great. What, uh, what is your website URL for people that want to go specifically there to find out how they can help or make a contribution? Um, it is. It's wildwashingtonrivers.org, and, and it's abbreviated to wild, W-A, rivers, dot org. Cool. All right, Angie, we're going to wrap this up. We want to right. thank you a bunch for coming on and, and giving us all this info. And, and, you know, it's not just a Washington issue, just like we told our listeners with the Utah stream access issue. It's, I mean, this can happen on your home waters, too. So paying attention yes. to this kind of stuff is, is very important no matter where you're at. Well, yes, and and it, you know if they get through with this, it, this this would be a precedent that would set uh, because they have the, this same company has eighteen other proposals on on the table right now, wow. and you know Hancock Creek. I mean, they're, it's all over the place. If if they get through with this one, where they can delist this river and and it, all the protection and all the public outcry, you know, we're fucked. And I, quack, I, quack, I, I quack. <laughs> so, so it's very important to, to to get involved because, like you said, everything is at stake. Yep. All right, we're gonna we're gonna let you go here. So, uh, okay. was it wildwawrivers.org? dot uh, org? Yes. And listeners, if if you want to take action, if you write a letter or make a contribution or anything like that, uh, send us verification to our email at theopenflypodcast at gmail.com, and we'll enter you into our monthly raffle to win some things and some stuff. So, Sweet. Yeah. That's, That's great. Rad. Yeah. It's, it's, worked. it's worked on our previous causes, so we're going to try and keep that going to just not, not really uh, bribe people into it, but you know, just give them a little, little treat for helping. <laughs> yeah. Oh, and I forgot to mention, um, if you do, you get into heaven. Oh, <laughs> sign hey, me up. <laughs> Great. All right, Andrea, thanks so much for coming on. Uh, we're going to hang up now, so bye-bye. Okay. See ya. Thank you very much. Bye. bye. <laughs> Get into heaven. I want to go. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, that uh, wraps up the episode. I believe we have an off week next week. Isn't this an off week? This I feel a little off. Uh, it's off day this, already. <laughs> yeah. This is an off day for sure. And. I think I have two or three days off of not doing trade shows this week. I just realized what? the problem. Okay, we normally uh, broadcast on Thursdays. Oh, it's Tuesday. It's Wednesday. It's, it's hump Wednesday. Day. That is hump day. <laughs> well, uh, yeah, but I got to fly out tomorrow, and you got back on Monday, and I got to fly out for another show after that. Well, it is the open fly. You should be doing a lot of flying. It is openly, openly. Yeah. All right. I don't really remember what the next show is, and it'll probably change between now and then anyway. So, right on. Yeah, I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna give you a preview because, you know what? Nobody cares about that anyway. Actually, we do have a little snippet at the end of this one. I, that reminds me. We we do. It's the competition show, isn't it? Fly. Uh, it's like the the fly fishing competition show. And at the end, after we sign off here, we're gonna play a little clip. Uh, Derek interviewed. What's his name? Because Connor Murphy was it? No? Connor Murphy, yeah, uh, a, com- a competitive fly angler is a little teaser for the next show. So, uh, very controversial topic, and it's one that out here on the West Coast it's not really talked about much because we don't really see that much of these types of things. But in Europe and on the East Coast, of the USA, uh, competition fly angling is is a pretty big deal and growing. Is oh. it a contact sport as well? Yes, <laughs> <laughs> you get, get the. You get to hip check guys out of your run. Oh, yeah, okay. If you combine it with a little MMA action, I think I'm in. Yeah, I think we should start a league here. At least as a as a spectator. <laughs> I say no to uh, the outfits. I want to choose my own. Thanks. Mm-hmm. No tights, none of that crap. Well, yeah, whatever. All right. Thanks again for listening. This is The Open Fly. You can find us at www.theopenflypodcast.com. On Facebook, when they feel like letting you see it in your feed, because, you know, they throttle that now. And mm-hmm. I think like five people get to see our posts out of our 600-some followers or whatever. But Google+, Plus, they actually let you see the stuff. Twitter lets you see the stuff. And you can subscribe on iTunes or Stitcher Radio to keep up with what's going on with us. All right. We will see you all in two weeks. Oh, wait. Um, Evan? Derek? Yeah. Oh, crap. Here it comes. Your flies are open. <laughs> Thanks. Bow, wow. 
All right, so I'm here with Cotter Murphy at ISE in Denver. <laughs> And I hit the record button this time. Okay, cool. so awesome. I'm glad that we got good, the that, that was a good rehearsal, right? No, that's great. Awesome. All right. So um, we're talking about competitive fly fishing. Um, Connor's been fishing since he was nine years old. He's now 19. You student up at Colorado State? I am. CSU. Okay, yes, okay. Sir. right on. Um, and he has um, been on various competitive fly fishing teams. Mm -hmm. And um, so tell me again, what's your perspective on the competitive aspect of fly fishing? Why did you get interested in it? Why are you continuing to do it? I got interested in competitive fly fishing because, you know, I, uh, I played soccer and whatever as a kid, but and fishing was always my passion, and I found that, you know, when I learned that there's I can do it uh, against other people and I can compete and see who's the best and that kind of thing, I found that, to, you know, I thought that was appealing to me at the time. I, you know, it's a lot of fun. And uh, what keeps me coming back, I, you know, I, you learn a ton. You get to interact with incredible people and you learn a lot of stuff that you would never find out. I, I think I learned more in one weekend at a comp than I might in a whole year or two of fishing just by myself, you know. Does competitive fly fishing give you a different view when you go fishing by yourself for fun? I think so. You know, I, I, I don't, I uh, sometimes catch myself kind of thinking, would that fish measure or would that one count? You know, I catch myself doing that some, but... You know, for the most part, um, I'm just implementing the techniques and stuff that I've learned at the comps and doing them when I'm fishing by myself because just for fun because they're so effective and I like catching fish. Right on. Does a um, typical day for competition? Um, tell me about that. Kind of. So you get up in the morning, pretty early, you know, five thirty-six. Um, pound some coffee, some breakfast. Get on the bus. Um, right after you get done with that, and I, I usually sleep on the bus, but a lot of guys will chat or get their leaders ready or stuff like that, and you drive to your venue. Um, and once you get to your venue, I usually are assigned a section of water, walk your beat, um, figure out what you're going to be doing that day, uh, set up your rigs, fish your beat, and that's about three hours, and you're going to get back on the bus, eat lunch on the bus, um, come to your next venue, same thing, Just figure out your game plan, figure out your water. Uh, fish it, and then after that, you get back on the bus, you go back to the hotel or wherever you're staying, you tie flies, and you talk with your buddies, and you get your game plan set for the next day, and just kind of hang out. What's your... Ladies and gentlemen, the show is now closing. All right, Connor, so tell me a little bit about your competition rig. What kind of rod do you use, kind of reel, um, you know, all the way down to the fly. What's your what's your what's your confidence set up when you're competing? Definitely. Uh, when I'm in Colorado, you know, I use a 10 foot three weight uh, Loomis NRX. Mm -hmm. That's been my rod now for a couple of years, and I love it. Um, I'm using that guy, and I've got a uh, I'm using a Lampson Lightspeed as my reel. Mm -hmm. um, and these days, I'm using a uh, kind of a Rio triple aught weight um, fly line, just kind of the, their Trout LT, because it's uh, Phipps Moosh put in some new rules recently that do not allow you to use a long leader. And I used to just use straight mono. I had 40 feet of mono on my reel onto some fly line, Ooh. and that's what I used, and it, it's great. It works really well. Um, but the fly line does actually shoot a little bit better. You get a better grip with it, and it's legal now because you can't have a leader that's twice, more than twice the length of your rod. Did you say Phipps Moosh? Phipps Moosh, yeah. What is that? Phipps Moosh is kind of like the FIFA of uh, fly fishing. I okay. forget what it stands for. It's like Federation Internationale Piscator. It's something yeah, like that. Yeah, this is a test. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's a mouthful, but it's awesome. It's it's awesome. And they, uh, they're the guys who make something fly fishing that was already tough in the beginning. You know, they make it incredibly hard, and they were the guys who make the rules. So, gotcha. Yeah. So to, you know, in your 10 years' experience, you've developed a, a passion for the competitive side of it. Yeah. Um, the guy that's, that's fly fish for 25, 30 years who just mm -hmm. goes out there and doesn't do it competitively. Sure. How do you win that guy over to, to the competitive side? I would uh, try and make him, i try and get him to understand my point of view where I think that, you know, if you want to continue to have a sport that draws young people into it and keeps, you know, is vital and is rejuvenated constantly with new people, I think that he needs to understand that uh, there needs to be a place for competitive fishing and getting people involved in that. And uh, I'm not, I don't think that it needs to be all the sport. And I think there's a lot of my favorite times of fly fishing are the quiet times, you know, that he probably enjoys. And I hear that argument a lot of, uh, you know, it's not, it's uh, ruining a great quiet sport. It's a quiet sport, and it is. And I'm pretty quiet when I'm competitively fishing, too. But uh, I think that guy needs to understand that if we want to keep the sport getting renewed, um, we need to have competitive fishing. Mm -hmm. So, what's next for you? I see you've got a hat here that says St. Peter's Fly Shop, Fort Collins. You're going to school. Yeah. What's next? Next for me, I guess, keep guiding up at St. Pete's and hopefully uh, a couple years down the road, maybe make it up to Alaska. But next on the list, I guess, I want to catch a steelhead. Get a so, nice, yeah. Um, 
So you, you guide also? I do. Yeah. Okay, so what do your clients get out of a guided trip with you being a competitive angler? Interesting you should ask that because uh, I kind of been marketing myself lately as a, a Euro nymphing guide. You know, if you a lot of people come in the shop and want to know about European techniques and they don't know much about it, and I feel that the best way to learn that is to get on the water with someone who does. So I, you know, I myself as a guide who can uh, teach you that, teach you how to fish that way. Nice. Yeah. Okay. Anything else you want to add about competitive fly fishing? No. Uh, go Team USA. <laughs> <laughs> right on. Thanks, Connor. No problem. Please, you just you can hang up on me. I'll call you back. <laughs> <laughs> we, just, we just lost her. Come back, Come back Andrew. Andrew, where did you go? That was an important question. Hello. That was rude. That was rude. <laughs> yeah, I um, yeah, I, w- I just I, I got bored. Yeah, I'll ask my. Oh, that's where, yeah. oh, that's where we got this echo. 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 Um, oh. Are you hearing? Are you hearing us echo? I am not. I'm um, except for you said echo three times, but okay. um, I, I'm gonna I'm gonna uh, hang, hang up and call you call you once more, more and see if we can fix this. Perfect. Okay. All right. Bye. All right. It was weird. Yeah. That happened. Check. That happened last week too. Yeah, but when we talked back. Are we still recording this? Yeah, but I'm gonna edit. It this could be good this stuff. This could be good stuff. Yeah. <laughs> this is this is what makes it special. This is what makes shows fun and real. Hey. That's why we love technology. I don't think we're echoing. Echo. Oh. Echo. All right. You, all right. You got it. We're gonna ask that question. 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 Ask that question.